Welcome to the 1978 podcast Halloween special. I'm here with David Weldon. Uh, by the way, before we get into it, I want to uh, bust these out, have these made. If you subscribe to the YouTube version and you send me a message where you want these to go, you get a packet of these plus a handful of other small but wonderful 1978 podcast merch. Uh, Weldon. What's up? How you doing? First name, David. Yeah. Thanks for having me on your podcast again. Yeah, buddy. Last time yeah. was fun. I've uh, improved my audio situation. Since. Yeah, it's good. You've improved a lot of things. There's more color in the background. Yeah. My, I have since bounce. degraded. My camera's <laughs> gone. and like you're, You look great and my face is all blown out, but I do have it's a light just, on uh, me, so at least I have that. Oh, well, it's... I've used some things I've learned from from your people, uh, <laughs> some bounce, and sure. I just have a GoPro, which was better than the. the oh, that's a GoPro. Oh, nice. Yeah, with the cam link, uh, the camera in the iMac is just so low res; it's pretty. I bad. know, yeah. Um. So today we're going to talk about horror films because, you know, it's close enough to Halloween, and horror films are are a great thing. Um. You have something you want to talk about, but first I kind of want to just glance over some mm -hmm. things um, that we can get back into or stay in, subject-wise. Sure. Um, so sort of where they started, where horror films started, and, you know, this isn't, uh, this isn't anything new to some people, um, right. but because we're doing a, a little Halloween special, I just want to touch on some things. Um, so we, we, or some of us have heard of Marie Georges-Jean Méliès, um, kind of where horror started, the French illusionist. And, uh, the late 1890s, you know, he, this is maybe not horror films per se, but sort of the, the, essence behind it and that is to elicit a reaction uh, of fear or 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 tension from the viewer and i think you're that's taking it way of, back well you know it's like if you're gonna think about it it's like it didn't just start in the 80s it didn't just start in the 70s true you know? no i'm not saying it didn't and um not only did where did it start but you know what's what's the the thinking the thought mm -hmm. process behind the whole genre, behind what makes a film good, what, ma what makes a horror film good. And, and there's a number of different things. Um, I'd, I'd kind of divide it from the top immediately going into two kind of general overarching categories. And that's like your shock scare and then mm -hmm. your actual sort of fear, your gut fear. So there's, there's movies that, that, make you that unsettle you that make you you know you're afraid deeper you've got this sort of like sickening fear then there's just the you know the guy popping out from behind the curtain or around, around the corner right uh you know shocker the, the knife coming at you uh, you know scary movie um those are kind of the two sort of worlds that right at the top of the pyramid i kind of go I, that's the first split that's where it starts yeah yeah um I'm not a huge fan of the shock and terror kind of films. The the um, what are the what are the ones that that you know? I guess the one of the the film that kind of started that sort of angle was the uh, Blair Witch, maybe. Yeah, I could po see that. Possibly. I could see Blair Witch maybe being from a shock from the shock standpoint of like jumping out, kind of kind of trying to catch you, kind of thing. Yeah, and just yeah. just sort of shock and, and fright, uh, mm -hmm. sort of somewhat surface level. Um, what are the ones they made more recently? And I'm I don't know why I'm spacing out. I could look it up. Um, there's a series of them. They're all like shot in a house, you know. And they just have objects move around. It's like one camera, super simple production. Blumhouse, I think. Um, mm, can't think of it. Let's let's look it up here. Just there's the one. There's the one. Uh, it's not necessarily a horror film, but it, it kind of could be. It falls in line with that thriller that came out, where it was about a blind guy that like was inside of the house 
and everybody was trapped inside. He was like blind, but he could hear. I guess he wasn't deaf. I'm trying how, to remember. How the, old is it? What's that? How old were they? Is the one you're mm, talking? About? This was like less than. This was like five years ago, maybe. Oh, uh, okay. I'm trying to remember what. It, wow. I'm trying to remember what it was. Because <laughs> uh, I'm like I'm. As right now, my mind's thinking of like classic stuff. Like yeah, exactly. Thinking of like Nosferatu and and. <laughs> uh, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre and stuff like yeah. that. Like that's what's running through my head right now. As far as when I think of like films, you know, yeah. I think oh. there's a, there's a difference between film and a movie too. Like Blair Witch to me is a movie. It's right. not, a, it's not, there's a story there. Sure. Yeah, but it's, yeah. it's more the a design of that but, is to but be it's still. Yeah. It's trying to get, it's like you said, it's trying to get a reaction out of you. Yeah. I'd say, I say Blair Witch as far as starting that shock genre, but I think Blair Witch was a little higher class then sure and yeah. I, I looked it up the ones i was thinking of was the paranormal activity oh yeah yeah those yeah those are kind of my sort of or standout example of just the mm-hmm. gotcha you know bang yeah and it's like just super shallow level scares and i'm not not saying that in a way that's knocking it i'm just saying it's different than exorcist in the sense of believable right. fear that sits deeper and sinks down and leaves something resonating and and can you could take that out of the theater and uh, cause you not to sleep, you know, mm-hmm. paranormal activity probably causes people not to sleep. But in my <laughs> opinion, well, I think it's part of how it's, it's filmed too. It's like, it's very much that, like that Jack, what jackass made popular yeah. in that POV good, camera, yeah. not POV, but like cameras, GoPros kind of, you know, real world shot in a way of that would be conventional to how you might shoot something in your home right. or in, in fact, your neighborhood. So it I makes it feel was, more real. As far as I am aware from the minimal amount of research I've done on the paranormal activity films and a lot of the Blumhouse production mm-hmm. uh, angles and these film these companies that make these sort of like low cost high high return kind of films, right? You know, it's the way they cast it, the the way they shoot it. the The paranormal activity was like, I mean you know camera on a tripod vfx in the in posts right a uh, lot of VFX. you know but but the but in in the sense of it being very basic on the cost end because you get somewhat mm-hmm. unknown talent and really basic setups and um most of it is just done with you know layers and plates to mm-hmm. put it all together and make things move in post and probably some some in camera effects you know with right well, and, that wor- and that works too, especially with the unknown talent, because if they had a bunch of people that you knew in there, like when you watch, when you watch the last two versions of it, like, right. you know, it's, a, you know, it's not real. And the idea behind paranormal activity when you're going into it is like, is this real or is this fake? Right. It's 1000% fake, but the content is designed to make you feel like, well, maybe it isn't. And right. especially for non industry working people, you know, people like you're not going to know that. Right. You know, you might think, oh, well, maybe some of this is real. I don't know. Like, I know there's movie magic and stuff like that, but like, you know, this all the way it's presented. And that's, that's, that's a part of why it's successful. That's the goal. That's the intention. You I know? think that the success though, in my opinion, is directed a lot at the way they cast it and who they're aiming at for the oh, audience. Yeah. Uh, it's knowing, it's knowing your market for right. sure. I mean, you it's put a 16 to 18 looking year old girl in there that gets scared. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, guarantee right there who's pay- buying a ticket on Friday. I, maybe not these days, oh, yeah. but back right. when those were. So, totally. yeah. And they're bringing their girlfriends. So there's two tickets. And obviously they're going on a date probably. So they're buying food. Like, so they're just thinking mostly from that end of, you know. Right. Is this going to make its return? And when you look them up on IMDb, they make a shit ton of money. Oh yeah, not well, just because the production in, cost is so small too. Right. Not just all, not just um, um, domestically though. I mean, these things are selling internationally. Mm-hmm. And then you could consider you know sales on DVD, Blu-ray, and now streaming and all that kind of stuff. And those package deals, you know, like that that nets them a lot of return as well. Yeah. That's actually yeah. a kind of an I uh, what I think is might be a good transition into something you wanted to talk about as far as sure. theaters and. Streaming. Yeah, I think. The, right now, there's been obviously, you know, we're in the middle of this, we're still in the middle of this coronavirus pandemic, especially yeah. here in the United States. And um, I've had a lot of conversations, especially on social media with people, just, you know, 
friends that post things and industry friends that are concerned about our livelihoods, you know, being, you know, I'm a cinematographer, you're a production designer and art director. And, you know, we're all, we're all trying to, you know, make sure that we're going to be safe and, um, and back to work and stuff like that. And I've, I've had a couple, like back in September, there was a friend of mine who it was, you know, he's much younger and I think he's, he's very new to the business in a lot of ways. And so, you know, like everybody started panic a little bit and he's, he's seeing, um, you know, what's happening with, it was the film Mulan when it, Disney decided to release it on streaming versus Christopher Nolan's tenant being released in theaters and seeing the response within the United States made him panic and forget. He's like, you know, theaters are going to go away. What is this going to do to our industry? So on and so forth. Yeah. And my initial response to that was like, I think this is a knee jerk reaction, but I want to do some research. I want to look into it. I'm, you know, I'm not just going to comment without really diving into it a little bit. So let, let me get something clear. You, you're what's he exactly speculating on again? He's speculating that the theater industry, like the theater, like the business model of theaters where we all go and sit down and watch a movie is going to go away. Okay. And that that will in turn diminish the value of the content that we make. So budgets will go down. Gotcha. We're not going to make a $200 million movie anymore. We're not going to have big budget TV shows. It's all going to go to the internet and streaming and, and, and there, and if it's being done in a little box or to your phone and now mind you, this, this is also pre Quibi's demise. So Quibi last week, Quibi's a disaster in hell. Yeah. It's a disaster and it, and it's gone. So this is also a month ago when Quibi was putting, you know, they, they raised $2 billion and pouring content into their platform to try to, you know, stimulate getting yeah. people to watch it. So, you know, I, th- my problem with the way a lot of people react to this stuff is they're taking a lot of things at face value versus looking at the business models that have existed for decades and then looking at the metrics of what has taken place right now to fully understand it. Because where this really begins is, when DreamWorks released uh, Tr- Trolls World Tour in March, and so in March, in, you know, it was it was released the last week of March, like March thirtieth. At that point in the United States, we were two weeks into a essentially full country lockdown, even though it wasn't every single state, but there was enough conversation on the news. So even states that weren't locked down, you had a lot of families that stayed inside. That movie was $100 million to make. And in its first two weeks, it made a $100 million return. And it only made a total gross profit of $120 million. Now, compare that to when Trolls 2 came out. Didn't you just say Trolls 2? No, it's a Trolls World Tour. Oh, oh, that was the first one? Yeah, it was the, that's the most recent one. I think the, in the previous one, I think it was Trolls 2. Oh, I think wait, it was three, so the or I could be Trolls wrong. World Tour being the third installment? I think. Or I okay. could be wrong. It could just it could only be two, and I might be have it backwards. But either way, um, you're talking about an... A, you're, right. I'm sorry if right. I'm not following you here. You're talking about a film that came out in March, and then there was another one after that at some point? No, I'm talking about just... Uh, I'm talking about the film that came out in March, and then but I'm saying compare it to the previous film that had come out the before the before, lockdown. Okay, all right like two years ago sure um okay. but no thank you thank you for jumping in because i want to make sure that i'm clear yeah, with yeah. what i'm saying and i don't want to confuse anybody either um so the previous film was just under 100 million dollars to make but it made a billion dollars in theaters wow and that was just in um, theaters globally that was you know worldwide. but just ticket sales not anything past that correct that was just Jesus ticket Christ. sales beyond that you know there's there's traditionally DVD and streaming deals are like, like for example, uh, like when interstellar Nolan's sci-fi movie was sold to HBO and Fox to put on FX that only netted them like a, it was like a $70 million profit. Okay. Um, or, or it was like, no, it was somewhere around like 40 or 50. I, I, I should pull up the stats because in, in theory, once interstellar made, and I'm jumping around a little bit, but, um, once Interstellar made all its money back, and then Nolan and the pro in the studio, Warner Brothers behind it, Interstellar only netted seventy four million dollars in profit after making back the hundred eighty million dollar investment. Right. So, but to go back to Trolls, 
Trolls only made $124 million globally. Tro- the, the last Trolls in March, just right. on streaming. Right. Which, that's a, that's so actually that com- pretty good. So it comes out the month that things shut down, or, or right. give or take. And right, and, still and you've got a twenty the, million dollar positive. Right, you've got you got you you made twenty four million dollars, but the previous film, where this one was supposed to be even more successful, netted you like a little over nine hundred million dollars. Well, that's that's I mean, there's like I look at that two ways. You you can't directly compare those because because COVID or not, right? No matter what sequels, you can't guarantee. But right. But the They're argument, the the, same the, and that's why I never, uh, that's where it starts. And that's where people started to difference. freak out. But this is where I, I pull into, I use Mulan and Tenet okay. as the argument. So Tenet, or uh, sorry, let's start with Mulan. Let me pull up my notes. Because yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a, not a lot, but it's In just a, a sentence deep. or two, you're, you, the thing that you're getting at here is this argument of is, has COVID shown us a a a uh, the road home for theaters or not is that what you're like yeah and i think and i think are they going under COVID, completely or i, I think the, the at the end of this what i'm going to say is that we've we're proving that theaters will survive in right. a different way i agree and streaming is also going to survive and this and it doesn't the there is an area that it will change dramatically and that actually took place in august of this year it's something that started from last year has now come full circle but i'll get to that um so with mulan so mulan came out it was targeted to come out over labor day weekend here in the u.s which is uh traditionally a three-day weekend you know you're gonna have families at home that kind of thing in order for you to get mulan to watch it you had to be you had to sign up for Disney Plus or already be a subscriber. So it's, let's say it's yeah, that was like six ninety nine. Then you have to rent the film for twenty nine ninety nine, and you so can watch you, it. You it was like a forty eight hour rental. You had to all. Get, you had to sign up for the service, and on top of that, then rent the film. Right. Fuck is that? Yeah, I'll get to that. <laughs> so you're paying thirty bucks. You're paying about thirty seven dollars after tax um, to watch this moon movie. And the idea behind that is that the, that price tag was if you were to take your family of four, and at least the average number of a ticket of a uh, a ticket is like thirteen dollars in the United States, you know you're going to spend less to watch it at home based on this price point than you would have if you'd taken everybody you know out to see it at the theaters before right. any sort of concessions and stuff like that. Like if you got popcorn and all that kind of stuff, just ticket sales alone. Um, the. Uh, this is, it's kind of a detailed thing, but take your time. So I, this is good. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I'm just like, this is the first time I really had a chance to really talk about it other than yeah. just writing it. And I'm like, ah, oh, this is like, this is so well, deep. I have, I have, I'm interested in it and I've got an opinion yeah. that I want to break out when you're done too. Sure. Yeah. So, um, so Mulan, so that at this time when I wrote my little piece in September, Mulan was out for 10 days. It had been out for 10 days since Labor Day weekend. It had brought in roughly thirty-seven point six million dollars internationally, and seven point five million in the United States. Uh, that's including with theaters open around the country. There were certain theaters, like here in Los Angeles area, Orange County, it, you can go down and go to a theater. Um, so roughly, the movie made forty-five point one million dollars over a ten-day period. Um, the initial in, streaming in numbers August? for Labor Day weekend were thirty-three and a half million dollars, uh, oh, giving it somewhere, giving the film somewhere north of eighty million dollars in revenue, um, as far as like the streaming and stuff like that. Um, now to jump to Tenet for a second, Tenet was a two hundred million dollar feature. So was Mulan. They both were two hundred million dollar features as far as the production cost. Tenet brought in two hundred and seven million dollars in both domestic United States and international sales over a three week period. It only brought in $29.5 million in the United States. So it's quite not a lot given that we, and it was only theatrical release. There's no streaming for tenant. Um, and a lot of people are saying like, Oh, Nolan made a mistake. This was not a smart idea and all that kind of stuff. Um, so going on to, let me see. So this is where I feel like, 
I feel like Nolan drew his line in the sand to say we have to save theaters, and it is a you know it's more than just a financial number, but let's just look at it from a financial number. So when he made Interstellar, Interstellar costs one hundred sixty five million dollars to make. It grossed six hundred ninety three point five million globally, just under three quarters of a billion dollars. Um, and Tenet was expected to make seven hundred fifty million. That was the anticipation that that's what that film would make, right? Uh, if it was released in theaters. So obviously it's a massive drop, but if you're looking at it from a numbers standpoint, Tenet would not have been able to make back the money uh, in a streaming platform of at least the 200 million. Um, so we look at Mulan again. Go back to Mulan. Disney Plus's downloads increased 68 percent over the over Labor Day weekend alone. So what that means is you had a massive spike in people signing up for either just a one month rental or one month of Disney plus so that you can watch the movie or they signed up for the yearly cost, which saved them a little bit long term. Um, but essentially what this comes down to is if say, let's just go ahead for the sake of argument and say that Disney retained all of those new subscribers because they grew as of April 8th after Labor Day weekend, they grew by 50 million subscribers to Disney plus. Um, they, to, they add, by September, they, they only grew to 60.5 million. So Mulan had made this massive spike and then they retained a lot of those people. That was, that's kind of the argument is that from April, May, June, July, August, September for six months, they've retained quite a bit of people. Um, now obviously there's going to be drop and there's going to be loss and that kind of stuff. So just from April to May alone, they grew by 4.5 million subscribers for Disney. Um, they essentially, according to Disney, they've reached their five year plan of subscribers in five months. <laughs> oh, that's those, a, that was that's their a five massive year deal. number. Those Say that, again? that, that was their five year plan that they, they hit that mark. They, months, yeah, they wanted to, they wanted to reach, uh, this, this, the, uh, it was like 55 million subscribers by five years. They reached it in eight months off you know, of this year one, one because, thing, because of this, I think because that, um, what happened to me, uh, I kind of, I can see what a possibility was is mm -hmm. Mulan obviously looked beautiful and kids want to see it. So right. you have, you have one massive marketing too, right? Massive. Yeah, they push right. kids stuff like that pushes and it can be splattered everywhere on kids meals and all that stuff. Right. So you can really you can really saturate. But mm -hmm. um so you have a pandemic where people are home and you've got kids at home and right. every parent, including myself, wants to do something to occupy the kids' time. Exactly. And you may not have one kid, you may have two, three, four voices saying, Mommy, Daddy, mm -hmm. we want to see this. So the pressure to do something like sign up for Disney plus can be incredibly high, not in a, not in a stressful manner, but just in a, what do we do with these kids? What do we, you know? And then mm -hmm. after they sign up for it and the kids watch Mulan and then they go play with their toys and mom or dad, then look at Disney plus and say, what did I just pay for? There's a ton of stuff on there for, for adults as well. So I think that that can right. also re result relate to retention. Yeah. And continue. Well, I think too, there's, you know, I think it's that definitely relates to retention and I think it's going to stay. I don't, you know, I think you have to think of it too, like the Netflix model. People are becoming increasingly less aware of where they put their monthly subscriptions. Yeah. And Netflix knows this. Most people still consider that Netflix is only $8.99 a month. The base fee is, is like $14.99 right. outside of yeah. just a two screen streamer. Right. which most people don't have. The two screen is 11.99. The 8.99 model doesn't even exist. It hasn't existed <laughs> for 5 years. Yeah. But most people still consider that they only pay about 9 bucks a month. But that's not true. Yeah. And if you multiply that by millions of people, that's a lot of money. You know, you know for it Disney, is though, but when you look at like uh, like this city and you and you look at your mm -hmm. the productions that are either about to start or are in production on like your union's website, you know, all the jobs mm -hmm. that are out there. Um, there is so much Netflix content being 
especially before COVID. Even now, there's a lot. Right. But right. I cannot figure out, and I'm not a bean counter, and it's, it's above my pay grade, but I can't see what Netflix's model is other than lose money for X amount of years, get your teeth around the market, and then get a return in 10 years. But I mean, they're I, not they're losing money. So much. That's, that's the thing. Where the reason they, why where else people they think they're money? losing money because they don't release their numbers. But where based else on, are they making an income other than that that monthly? Like, what is their other income? Let me what well, let me they, let me continue with the Disney okay. info because I think that will answer this question as well. Sure. Because Disney's the f- first one to really be this transparent with the numbers that they're making when it comes to streaming, and the reason being is the majority of their stocks are valued based on their parks, and Disney is had decided this summer to pivot more of their resources into the streaming platform. And so the release of these numbers coincides with trying to entice people to buy stock in Disney. That's 100% the case. Mm -hmm. And it's not that the value of the parks is going down, but they know that, and and I'm not going to make this political, um, they know that the United States is not going to get to a place anytime soon where the revenue stream from the Disney parks will equal the growth that we've seen through Disney shares over the last few years. Um, so they had to pivot. And I think this, and so the numbers from just Mulan from a, from a, this standpoint. So with the increased revenue that Disney brought in with Mulan, Mulan was able to bring in just by the subscribers in five months, they increased the revenue by 7.3 million per month. So on average, if you look at, so you've got the two different price points. You've got the yearly price point, you've got the monthly price point. The yearly price point equates to $5.80 per month, which is more than half from Netflix. So if we, the average for Netflix is roughly like $12 or almost 13. So let's call it like 12.50. For 5.80 a month, which would be 69.99 a year. Let's use that since it's the lower monthly fee. Excuse me. Based on the current number of subscribers, Disney has 60.5 million subscribers as of September, as of a month ago. Do you know how much that's worth per month? $350 million. It's $4 billion a year. That's what that, that's what Disney plus is now worth. But what are they spending to keep to not only what were they spending when the parks were open, but what are they, what's the metrics on the parks being sitting there idle costing taxes, costing maintenance, whatever, and not having zero revenue. And right. I, from what I understand, I think I read something that but said you, that the parks But you made, can't necessarily put the streaming platform and the parks in the same context as exactly. far as how they balance each other out well, that's what because I was they're say, two different businesses. That's that what point. I was going to say is that I think I read it not too long ago that the parks made more money than the films combined. Oh, yeah, by far. Right. By far. Yeah. So it's does massive. that, it's does massive that number that you But the difference me, being is, so every time you have to consider too, so Disney is made up of Marvel, Star, uh, Lucasfilm, Star Wars, and, yeah, but and Disney originals. That number you gave me, what is that for their entire, everything they have to offer, which is essentially four, just their streaming? Well, four billion, that $4 billion per year revenue is just for streaming based on the 60 and a half million subscribers right now. What was their revenue on the parks in full swing though? Uh, I don't have that information uh, right in front of me, but I will tell you this: the last Marvel movie, Endgame, netted them three billion dollars in a theatrical release that only ran for three months. So that that this is where my argument starts to shift back into why theaters won't go away. And are you saying the, theaters won't go away because they're too valuable? Yeah. Oh, one hundred percent. Because if I can make three billion dollars off of, you know. Marvel and Marvel's Endgame cost just over three hundred million to make, but netted them three hundred billion dollars, and that's just in films. The film, it's not merchandising and licensing and mm. any of that other stuff. Just and theatrical ticket sales. Just theatrical ticket sales. So, and this is where it's the pot gets sweeter in a little bit for for Disney and and the rest because this will happen. Um, the I, next I really want to tell you my opinion. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm almost done. Go ahead. No, no. Go. It's just, just it's I'm so, the details. Are, it's so about, layered. Yeah. yeah. Um, cause you have to figure, you have to look at it from the relationship of if I can make three, if I release two Marvel movies a year, if I just release two of them yeah, and if I do it based on the metrics of let's use Endgame as the main metric, um, even though it's 
technically at the top end and you'd want to come down. I can make $3 billion off of one film. Let's say the second film only makes $2 billion. That's still $5 billion that I've made off of two films. And from my, and it's like, oh, well, that's just one studio. Well, technically the studio owns multiple. If I put out a Star Wars, Star Wars is going to make me another billion dollars over Christmas into January. You know, realistically, Disney makes somewhere, can make somewhere between five to $6 billion a year off of putting out two to three films a year. So they, now, they, they have so many the, properties the, that are so valuable that they right. themselves. Right. But the, and the movies only cost them roughly half a billion dollars to make in the context of, you know, because I think Star Wars was, well, not even half a billion because as if you, if you took Marvel, be, that would be like 300 million. And then yeah, we have, yeah, it'd be like six, be like six to 700, you know, million to make. Cause for one, for three, if you oh, for three, three of them, because yeah, yeah. the la- end game was three hundred million. If you took another Marvel and put another three hundred million tag on, it'd be six hundred million, right. and then another say a hundred million for a Star Wars movie. But you're still going to make like six billion dollars. The trade off is massive versus and they're fronting you, all that on, on their own. You don't see like six different investor names at the beginning of the film. It's just right. Disney, right? They well, they have other they have subsidiaries and and you know. Not shell companies, but they have other companies that. But they're not. Are they're not sharing platform. that profit, are they? It's all Disney, if, I, if I'm understanding. Yeah, Disney. Yeah, Disney makes all that profit. Yeah, at that point, you know, like it's you like see they, some movies that's where that come the out, shareholders and that kind of stuff comes into play. Like a like a bigger action movie that's Paramount or something, but it says in the beginning Paramount and Skydance and Lionsgate and mm-hmm. da, da, da. it's like so everyone's chipping in to make that right. movie, not Disney. Well, that's. That's why it was such a big story that kind of because of the election coming up didn't really make its waves that it was reported that James Bond was Apple TV, Apple Plus was trying to buy it for $600 million. And that was another $200 million feature. They were trying to buy just that film or the Bond franchise? They were trying to buy just that film just for streaming. Oh, just the the rights to stream on on Apple. Right. God damn. But the theory is, is that the Bond film could gross over a billion dollars globally. And that's why they pushed sure. it to next year. Right. And I mean, you're talking 600 million versus it's, you know, it's half, you know, it's theoretically So do half, they sell you know, out especially. to Apple or wait and, and roll the dice when. They're right. Get Plus done. you have to consider too, that there's going to be deals made after the theatrical release. You know, it goes back to my interstellar conversation of, sure. you know, when Inter- interstellar ended up making and, you know, it was, they were like, my notes right here is, so they made a deal with HBO and FX, and then the deal brought them just over 18 million uh, domestically, and globally it brought them 74 million by making that deal to put it on all the HBO internationals and FX international for like FX movie channel and stuff like that. So, yeah. you know, it's an additional 100 million dollars in gross profit. You know, that's going to happen for uh, for the studio that made James Bond. They're going to make that deal too with you know whoever whoever they're going to make that carrier for the the film after it goes uh, through its theatrical run. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think because there's even and Disney second. Disney only plays in the superhero romance children's genres. I mean, they don't right. they're really kind of a niche, and they're right. still making a killing. It's pretty insane. Oh, it's it's incredible. I mean, the deals that Bob Iger, the former CEO of Disney, made to bring Marvel in, uh, under Disney's wing. And to bring uh, 21st Century Fox in, just incredible. Like, yeah. you want to talk about, like, we talk about Steve Jobs and we talk about Bill Gates and stuff like that. Like, Bob Iger doesn't get enough credit as far as what he has done from a business perspective. Whether you agree with it or not is a different conversation. But well, just, just from just a as numbers a proponent perspective. of Disney to be make Disney valuable yeah. and grow it. Of right. Course. Yeah. Well, because yeah. because Walt Disney's design of disney was always to create content in-house with animators things like that and then under um the previous ceo uh he's really famous in my, his name escapes my mind but he did like the lion king and aladdin and all that stuff before back in the 90s um before Iger? You know, before bob Iger, yes um he they started to flounder in the you know the 2000s and then when the acquisition 2005 of Pixar came into oh. play where, you know, Pixar was owned by Steve jobs. Right. Uh, it was started, you know, by Steve. Yeah. Um, he put the funding up for it and, uh, and with John Lasseter and put John Lasseter in charge. And then they, they, you know, 
Bob and his relationship with Steve allowed them to acquire Pixar. And then it, right. you know, that, that led to more films and, you know, Monsters Inc and Toy Story and all these kinds of these amazing films that, you know, became the new generation of computer technology. It was, yeah. a, it was a big part of it. Um, there's another, one other thing I wanted to mention, but I'm, I'm kind of losing my train of thought cause I'm getting sidetracked. Well, can you, can um, you kind of go back and, and, and somewhat of like recap nutshell, so Disney is big enough to keep every theater open or th- some theaters. I mean, like what's the, what's the sort of like overall sort of. The well, here's what's going to happen. There. So in 1948, um, there was a, it's called the Paramount antitrust law came into play. And essentially it was a law that came in to break up all the major studios from having monopolies over the front to end completion of a film from creating it to distribution because it destroyed independent theaters. Uh, um, that's going away. It's already going away. So in the about. end of November of last year, the department of justice, um, in a circuit district court, I don't have the full info. It's, you know, you can find it on Wikipedia, but, um, they essentially terminated it the, because all the only company that remained from the original antitrust lawsuit, is the Walt Disney Company. They're the only company that remains. And as of August 7th of this year, they've started the, it's called the two-year sunset termination period. And it's essentially giving independent theaters a chance to work something out so that they don't go away. So what this means is that Disney, Warner Brothers, Universal, Paramount, all the mate Netflix, if they wanted to, any major studio that makes content can now own their own brick and mortar theaters and put their content in. So what that means is, and I fully anticipate this will happen by the summer of 2021. This is just my own personal belief, just based on I'm interested in this kind of stuff and I read it and watch it. I believe that if I think they're all, all the major studios are waiting to see what happens with AMC because AMC is the largest theater company in the United States. And they've already said, like, we're going to go bankrupt. We're going to have to close theaters and all that stuff. And everyone in the country is freaking out. Disney's going to buy them, guaranteed. So Honestly, gonna, you should probably gonna, buy Disney stock right now Disney's or buy take, cheap AMC stock because it's going to become Disney stock. So they're going to, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to, what do you, what do you call that? You know, um, when there's blood in the streets, oh uh, yeah, you know, there's blood in the water, really. Whatever it is, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's like it's, it's like, like AMC's bleeds to death goes out, sells their their brick and mortar pennies on the dollar, yep. exactly. and then Disney essentially grows from that. Yep, they're gonna grow from it. The idea being that Disney, you know, an AMC is probably the best setup. You know, they have they have hundreds of really strong brand new theaters all across the country. And it's going to take a facelift to rebrand you, them to something else. Are you, you know, were you saying the AMC is the only um, company that's holding out the longest and staying alive and not completely shutting the door yet? They're not the only one, but I think they're the biggest. Um, okay. You know, Pacific Theaters is another big one. Um, uh, what's the, the other? Uh, the Regal Cinemas is another big one. But Regal has already said that they're, they're weeks away. And they may have, I may have actually missed that. They may, I think they have already talked about shutting down because they're much smaller. Um, but there's, you know, Alamo Dra- Daft House and stuff, Dra- Daft House, Draft. like they're independently owned, stuff like that. They're probably yeah. not going anywhere um, as long as they can weather the storm. But what it's going to create is a problem for licensing. So you're going to have Disney. If you want to watch it, if you want to go watch the next Star Wars, you got to go to a Disney theater if this happens. You're not mm-hmm. going to be able to go to whichever theater you want. So what? So what does this create now? So now we've got a situation where when we had movie pass a few years ago and you could use movie pass at random theaters and the movie pass ultimately went under and then, and cause every, cause movie pass went under because AMC and the rest of them all started making their own. Like, Oh, we'll make one of our own. So AMC made their own little subscription platform and all that kind of stuff. So who's to say if you're Disney, you've got 60.5 million subscribers yeah. Yeah, for an extra f- five, bucks five bucks a month. month. Yeah. yeah. You can go to the theater and you can see two movie, three movies a week. Right. Which you've you just even go du- to, by increasing by five dollars a month to sixty million subscribers. You just went from a four billion dollar platform to an eight billion dollar platform. So imagine how many people are going to look at that 
and say, wow, I get the streaming at home and I can go to, I can go to see three movies a week. The consumer will benefit. Yes. In, in their minds because they're already paying for one. Right. And now, Oh my God, I used to pay $13 to see individual movies. And now I've, I'm blah, blah, blah. but you're only able to see Marvel, Disney, and Star Wars. Right. So now what happens? Okay. Say, and, and trust me, Netflix is going to jump on board eventually. Well, if someone some like, if someone like Disney bought brick and mortar and made a brand name theater, guaranteed other big names or there's going to be someone all, else that'll do it. They're and, all going to follow. And that's, they, they're that's have what to. I was going to say. Like when you... it's, this, it's the a complete opposite of streaming with Netflix. Once Netflix did it, everybody else had to follow. Exactly. It's like people have said to me, they're like, well, what if, you know, why can't they work it out so that like all the prices are the same? Well, that would be a monopoly and it's against the law. It's against the antitrust laws. That can't happen. You can't have Netflix, Disney, Amazon, the rest of them all get together and say, hey, guys, we're all going to match our prices right. to make it so everybody signs up. No, you have to have that competition. And, and plus, just business in general, no one's going to do that. Right. They're just not going to do it. So rushing. what? Ha- so what happens on the flip side of this? You've got, you've you've already got Netflix. You've got Amazon Prime. You got Disney. And you got more and more coming, and you basically have the big three right now. They're all going to have their own theaters. Yeah. They're all going to have some, you know, and subscription be, services be, that are connected and all that there'll stuff. There'll be content you can only see in the theater and not online. Exactly. For the first month. Or exactly. Something, whole yeah. Thing. And yeah, you know, I, and it's I, uh, and it's going to evolve from there. It's going to. You know, we're still at the beginnings of new technology every 10 years. Anyways, like who knows what it could become? You know, who knows if, if you go, if you end up getting your Amazon, you have your Amazon prime already that takes care of your shipping and now your video streaming yeah. and that, and people keep saying, Oh, Amazon prime's going to video stuff's going to go away. No, it's not. Cause and Amazon makes a ton of money. Why anybody, would they get rid of something? It's great yeah. marketing for them. If anybody yeah, they're can not, afford they don't buy... really compete, yeah. but it does help. It helps their marketing because they make all their money on on product sales and if anybody so, could afford to buy brick and mortar it's yeah exactly yeah right. for them to buy they're already buying up old malls around the country just to become sorting centers for packages oh really so okay well, let's buy an old theater wow. boom cleaned up no problem done they probably own a handful of old theaters already with the mall they probably already do i wouldn't be surprised and they're just their marketing you know? team sitting there but who's to say the next iteration in the next 10 to 15 years is during the day at certain hours you can go to your Amazon Prime movie theater and you can select which movie you want to watch. You can, you know, because there's, you know, maybe either A, it's technology that somehow yeah. we get into a space where multiple people can be at the theater, but we're all watching different things. Well, that's that's you what know. I was getting at is when you brought yeah. this up and you were starting to talk about Disney um, keeping theaters alive, uh, mm-hmm. what that might be. Way back in the day, I went to some movie theater. I'm forgetting the details. It wasn't in L.A. County, um, although there might be that I haven't been to. But I went to some little, like, theater that seemed from, like, the Google search kind of thing. It didn't seem like much. But having gone to it and gone inside, you sit in it and you're in this space that was comfortable. It was, like, lounge chairs with uh, mm-hmm. footstools, little ottomans. Yep. And a waiter and stuff like that. So it was like seeing a movie in your th- living room, but mm-hmm. on a bigger, much bigger screen. Not a stadium like multiplex, right. but a huge screen nonetheless. And and a really nice Barco type, you know, professional projector right. type setup. So And that's something that AMC has installed in many of their theaters now. And not just in the major markets of like LA and New York. It's I've gone back I'm originally from Maryland and I've gone back to Maryland. I'm like, oh wow, like in a relatively big city of Annapolis, there are I, there's a theater that rivals the theater here in my neighborhood in Glendale, California. Yeah, and I'm like, well, okay, all right, cool. Like, well, when I it, when I mean, I saw, the cost to build it's so it's so minimal now. Yeah, exactly. Well, here's where I'm connecting the dots on on Amazon and mm-hmm. Disney. So, you years ago when I saw this theater, this was pre COVID and everything, but it had. Of a, 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 a flavor and a vibe in there where I would rather go to that than the stadium theater right, myself. Right. Um, obviously without a pandemic, but I mm-hmm. think that there's value in that. Now, if you bring in this thinking that a company would potentially buy brick and mortar and have it be branded their own theater, they can also 
there can also be middlemen where all you really need is an internet connection and a nice projector and the brick and mortar, and you can show any content. So if you're licensed right. to show Amazon, Disney, so and so and so, there may be a lot of content that Amazon licenses to show in these sort of what I would call like a boutique theater. So if you don't go to the Disney theater and you don't have a Disney pass or whatever that ends up being, mm -hmm. you can just go see a movie, but right. all kinds of different content is up. You know, the new movies out, but on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays, they're showing random stuff, you know, but you see it in a theater setting and it's something from Amazon or Netflix or whatever. So I think that there's this potential for these boutique theaters that are either a Disney theater but it's much more relaxed um, or these boutique independent theaters. Well, I guess I shouldn't call them independent, but these theaters that are, that are sort of an are outsourcing or subleasing content that's out there and just, you know, adding a fee to show it and paying a licensing fee to the produce to the content creators. The you viability know, of that ways. is suspect to like, I'll use the, the Star Wars, the last Star Wars movie versus Quentin Tarantino's last movie and ArcLight. So ArcLight essentially made a deal with Quentin and said, "Okay, you're gonna get first run." Uh, the it was like um, uh, I forget what the time period was, but because Star Wars ended up getting pushed, and I was like, "You're gonna get first run with the Cinerama Dome in Hollywood." Yada yada yada. You know, you put it in the movie, all the shit. Well, then Disney came back to Arclight and said, we have to push Star Wars. We're running it early or something. And they said, if you don't give us Quentin's slot, you don't get Star Wars Wow! in any of your theaters, period. So I think the licensing is still going to exist, but there's going to be a big problem in this context of like, I think what you're saying is a little further away because technology is going to have to make it a one-to-one -one experience. So right now we're, we look at theaters, even though you might go middle of the day on Tuesday and there's it's you and one other person in the theater, Yeah. but the potential of it being 20, 30, 40, 50, a hundred people in the middle of the day is always possible. Yeah. And that's what those deals are made based on. And you know, they're really made based on the weekend, but the idea is we own the theater. So the people that are going to control that design are the people that are selling the licensing for their movie. Sure, but, but there, there's also going to be the stadium theater. There's just, I think, going to be right. these offshoot boutique streaming theaters that are that are essentially using high grade equipment to show you something that you would like. Your, instead of streaming in your house, you can get the theater experience. Right. With the same content potentially you might see at home. And that and that just, might exist within the model of like a Disney versus like cuz you kind of you kind of touched on both saying like it could be independent maybe not. I don't know if it would survive independently, but maybe. But I think you could see a Disney doing that cuz like for example in Glendale for a number of years there was a small boutique theater that had like exactly what you were describing like and it was before AMC really did it of like the recliners you could get yeah. alcohol, it was like a living you room could theater, dessert, everything. Like I remember when I think I don't remember what theater it was, but you and I went and saw Terminator a couple of years ago, the original Terminator, and we sat up in the balcony, and it was kind of like that. You know, it was like you had yeah. like someone serving you and waiting on you because we paid like twenty bucks to see the film oh, each. Was that kind of thing. Play a Vista? That might have been. I can't remember what it was, but was I would nice not be theater, surprised like, if that exists. Yeah. But within those companies, like those, I think. You know, Disney is maybe puts a couple little in there. You know, maybe they put one in the Pacific Palisades. They put one in Malibu. Yeah. You know, they put them in some of the higher dollar areas. Yeah. They know they're going to reap the benefits of charging. Because the one in Glendale, it was like thirty bucks to yeah. go and sit. And I did it like twice, and I was like, yeah. Yeah, "It's nice," but I'm like, then it. you then you're buying a meal on top of it. Next thing I know, like, I think I went there with my girlfriend at the time. It was like a hundred and forty dollar night, and yeah. I was like, and you start to think to yourself. <laughs> You have to really love going to the movies because yeah. if you think I just spent X amount of dollars, but that could have got me two years of subscription to see all this stuff at home and I have exactly. a 50 inch TV and da, da, da. Right. So that's it, why I think the subscription a, model is really going to take over yeah. uh, with a lot of things like this. You know, we're going to see more Amazon stores and stuff like that. Like, and it's, and yeah, you may not agree with it. You know, the, our audience listening 
I don't necessarily agree with all the time either, but we still do it. Like as much as yeah. I'm like oh, Amazon, I well, hate how they're doing things. I still have an Amazon account. I use goes, it all the time because it it's to me it's more reliable. It goes back to convenience, dude. It's other convenience. things, you know. It's it's we're all we are all suckers for convenience, uh, and yeah. I I hate to admit it, but if you can yeah. if I can have all this shit in one place. Well, you got a wife, like for, for you, like you got a wife and a child at home now. Like, you know, you we order Amazon years, but you got a kid now. You got to worry about the, the kid. Time. The kid's the focus. Yeah. You know? It's easy. Yeah. You just get on your phone and you press a few buttons and food shows up at your door. Yeah. Postmates, Uber Eats, all that stuff. It That's all insane. exists because our lives, we, it's we put too, bad too much that it's, on our plates. It's, it's scary to think where that's going. And if we just keep making it the most convenient thing in the world and then it somehow breaks and we don't know what the fuck to do, that's yeah. the part that makes me scared about the whole thing. Is That's what was really interesting so about this pandemic in a lot of ways. Because I, I remember in the in the first couple of weeks, like in the first week of April, um, talking to people and, you know, it, you know, I think you and I talked and, you know, everybody, we were all talking, yeah. just catching up and you know, all trying to, you know, find some common ground. And sure. one of the many conversations I kept having was about, uh, food delivery and yeah. i could never get any of the apps to like have it available to i couldn't even like target would be like oh check back in a couple of days yeah and i was like yeah, yeah. you know and you it was one of those things of because we were all refreshing. is it safe to leave the house and go to a, a store and touch things and all that stuff and i think we saw what happens when the convenience granted there is a safety element of it but when the convenience goes away what happens? It's People don't spend money when the convenience is gone. I remember seeing a lot of, um, so as soon as. For a second there, I got to interrupt for a second there. I thought your cup said 1975. And I was like, what is wrong with your branding? Something <laughs> it was changed. Just the, the way the light was uh, hitting it. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Um, that's good. I forget what it was. If it was just. Uh, I think something, so there was some sort of political announcement. So our industry shuts down on March 13th. Yep. A lot of stuff had been shut down and, and shut down within like that next week. So that was kind of a an eight-day window there of like a huge amount of doors shutting in yeah. for numerous reasons. And then the presidency or something, it was like we're shutting down China. So... Yeah, they close the borders. Yeah, and, so like, you know, the, the borders are closing except for relatives, da da da, whatever it is. So right. this air of fear was sort of ramping up and um damn it, what was I the, what were you just talking about a minute ago? Shit. Um uh, I was just saying like the fear of leaving the house and, you know, uh postmates and stuff shutting down, you know, or, or not being able to use postmates or whatever and, yeah, and the fact that the convenience the loss convenience. of convenience. Um, yeah, for how we do things. I had a I had a a friggin' something I was gonna say about convenience in there, but I, I kind of lost it. But, oh. um, I was gonna say something about something breaking down, and and it was basically a really. Oh, I know. What I was gonna say that announcement from the 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 and presidential administration came through and I start to see a lot of posts of people posting videos, a really like a really strong flood of videos of like the toilet paper and people yeah. lining up for grocery stores when the doors open at 6 a.m. and stuff. Yeah. So the well, there was a big fear at that time too, that manufacturing was going to stop. They were people because that was something that was said in that press conference that the president gave where he said that, uh, commercial shipping wasn't going to stop from overseas. And there was a big panic thinking like, well, are our products all coming from overseas or not? Yeah. And everybody's like, well, am I going to be able to get toilet paper? And everybody freaked out. Right. Yeah. But what I noticed was the, these videos are coming out and I guess it's hard. I'm, I'm having trouble putting my finger on what, like, I'm trying to, the point I was trying to make. I got, a, like, too many ideas at once there. But um, <laughs> this flood of, of of fear comes out, and people start uh, reacting to the news, and you see, like, 
videos from CNN on the subject. Like CNN wouldn't normally get a million right. views, but now they're getting like 1.5 million views within a day on all these videos they're posting. Well, they and all so, were too. All, every, yeah, no matter so what company it was. Like you're seeing this traction and people are thinking, well, if, if that many people are watching this, there must be something to it. So they're, they're attributing truth to, to volume of viewership. To a numbers count. Yeah. 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 And, and that snowballs. And so this fear thing was really ramping up and it was happening in my house and, and, uh, the, I guess the point I'm trying to make was that, um, a lot, I think that a lot of this, I'm, I really, I'm, I apologize. I'm like, I'm trying to like pinpoint what I'm trying to say. And I lost I've, this little like, cor- I feel like cor- to me, what I'm sensing from you is I feel like it's, it's the idea that a captive audience can, and this kind of ties into our conversation about streaming and theaters as well. And then numbers and financial aspect. And when you own a captive audience, like what happened when we all were at home and we're watching these videos online and we're, it's like you, it, that influences decisions on a massive scale, yeah. you know, more so than I think people realize whether it's a positive thing or a negative thing. And I think clearly there were a lot of positives in the context of the pandemic and safety, but there's a lot of adverse negative, you know, businesses shut down things like that because people weren't spending money and we weren't yeah. going outside and all that kind of stuff, you know, you know, what I could actually talk about is, is, is there's an interesting sort of connection there. Um, to break off from the whole like Disney and the theater thing. Yeah. But mm-hmm. There's an interesting connection to like what these, this fear, just all the fear and the, but going back to the horror genre. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget where I read it, but like uh, someone said that one of the um, scariest things isn't necessarily like a guy coming through your window with a knife, but the scariest thing is that your, your loss of, ability to your loss of freedom loss of ability to control yourself like as such as like being tied up like you can't go anywhere you're alive and able but you can't because you're bound somehow so the loss of the ability to control yourself or or move about freely um Mm -hmm. and i think that that had some connection to that and it definitely did with me with the whole COVID thing and 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 feeling like a horror film in a sense because yeah. well, a lot of it too is rinse and repeat. You get up every day, you get on the computer. Well, I went home that eat Friday. A bit, you go to bed. Yeah. That Friday that the the job I was working on mm-hmm. shut down, and my wife was like, didn't was scared of COVID, and she's watching the news and listening and all social media rampantly. Right. So she's completely like, you know, freaked out. So we didn't even leave the house at all, I think, for a week. Like, hardcore didn't go out. Mm-hmm. And finally, I go out, and I go somewhere, and I, I can't remember where. I think it was Home Depot. And mm. there were people everywhere. Yeah. And lots of people with no mask. And, and I got this really strong feeling like I had been put through some sort of test or trick. And that sense of, like, some characters in a horror movie where it's like, you know, uh, saw or something where it's like, you were just a test just got put on you and, mm-hmm. and no one else knows about it. And you were just ran through the ringer. I mean, I wasn't beat up. I didn't get it. It's just like that sense of like, Oh God, got to go home. Got to go in hiding. Watch out. You're going to die. Disease, disease. And then you get back out to society to go to a store for 20 minutes and you, and no one seems to give a fuck. Well, I think I'll relate that to a storytelling aspect, and it's somewhat political because I don't want to make this about politics because I yeah. know that could be very polarizing. Yeah. Um, not between you and I, but well, just, I don't want to. I don't want to turn everyone anybody knows off. already. You know. Like, yeah. No, I, know. I just don't want to turn anybody off. I but know. I think with the lack of messaging that was coming to us from the White House as oh, far yeah. as what was going on, yeah. In the relationship to when we talk about this horror genre kind of stuff and how you ignite a response that that's very much similar to in the context of like, if you're watching a scary movie, yeah. you are being, you, you are going along for the ride on a great scary film. Uh, you, you are a character. Sure. 
the audience is a character that's you're learning as we go as well, just as the main characters and the other characters. And if it's done right, that's what it's going to feel like. And I feel yeah. like that's what we all kind of lived because we were all learning as we went. Yeah. Still are. You know, still well, look are. At, look at ways. the exorcist, the original exorcist. The priest shows up to the house, not knowing what's going on, assuming it's somewhat basic of yeah. an exorcism. Turned out to be above and beyond anything he did ever right. experience. And then he dies, you know, horribly. Mm-hmm. But it's like you're seeing, you're, it's like you're vicariously as an audience member seeing how this guy is, you know. He's trying to do his job. He's trying to do good. And he just can't fix the situation. And it just keeps worsening and getting crazier and weirder. And mm-hmm. and he sent well, I think it's very much sink. in the in the context of screenwriting how – when a, a script is being written and a film is being made, uh, you know, there's different connections that are made for the audience to make you feel. So you relate to someone at that moment in the exorcist, like the audience becomes the priest yeah. as they're learning and going. And then it starts, you know, the audience obviously is going to die from that. And his character then takes over and then finishes out. And then you start to, you become a little more fluid and then you move into another character at that point, yeah. you know, and that's, and it's, I mean, that's what's so interesting about storytelling and, and the horror genre in general. It's like, I'm not a big horror fan. You know, I'm just, yeah. I'm not, but I'll watch them. My girlfriend loves them. Yeah. So I go to all the movies with her and I'm, you know, I'm like I'm doing that, yeah. you know, a lot of stuff. I don't, it just still gets me, but yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of really great horror films out there. Yeah. There really are. Well, they can know. be done well and they can be done bad. Right. Um, to, to, and even to the comment- campy, like, shitty ones are still can still be fun and i think yeah. that's a part of it too is yeah that genre has built itself in a way that some of these really terrible horror movies is a part that's a part of it you know that's some you know you go like we go to movies and see movies or watch movies with friends and family or whatever yeah. as an experience whether it's a horror film or a christmas movie or a star wars or something and that's a part of the relationship we have with storytelling so i think that well if you like if you look horror. at like horror movies and them being good and bad, you could like it's uh, subjective too. Exactly, it's, it's a, yeah. the, if so. Like, here's an analogy. Take like an F1 race car, formula like super expensive, super high tuned. Everything is mega precision, and consider that like your highbrow, well written, well cast, well shot and lit horror film. That's mm-hmm. just you know. A lot of thought has gone into it. And then take like a figure eight destruction derby race with cars that are spray painted the number on the side and the guy's drinking Coors Light while he's driving the track, right? They're mm-hmm. both races. Yeah. You're watching them both wondering who's going to win, but they both have a different aesthetic. And right? there's a different appeal to that too. Right. You know, you so to they're not it. wrong. F1 isn't yeah. better. It's different. It's definitely right. opinion based. And the, and mm-hmm. the, the demo destruction derby race still a race it's just you may yeah. like that better so well it's it's part of how our like how we all grow up and we develop taste right you know we our taste for clothing our taste for you know f- you know and that's like food stuff like that but food in a way of you know like oh i i like you know this type of food versus that type of food you sure. know it's a part of it can well, be I culturally like to, driven i like know? to go to a nice steakhouse but i also like panda express yeah so totally. yeah. you know they're both good <laughs> one one right. one may not sit well with you, but right. you still. Like and sometimes it culturally, those things don't add up. Like there's going to be certain people that aren't going to align with that based on their upbringing. Sure. You know, it's like I always find it interesting when we talk about, uh, you know, especially like, on, I'm gonna I'm gonna wait because my my girlfriend's pouring water, and I'm sure it sounds like a drill going off. I can. Or hear maybe it. not. Do you hear it at all? No. At least I don't think I do. Oh, okay, maybe not. Anyways, um. I, I think it's always interesting when we talk about sports and stuff like that and sports teams. And I'm a big sports yeah, fan. Yeah. I'm wearing a Dodgers hat right now. So it's like this pre you know, I should I'm be from Maryland, much. but I'm not allowed to be a Dodgers fan. It's like, well, why? It's oh, like, well, yeah. I live in LA. Well, just cause you live in LA. And I'm like, well, I was only a Baltimore Orioles fan because that's the team I was exposed <laughs> to as a child based yeah. on the relationship of where my parents decided to have my birth and where you I grew s- up. You said you were going to get an Orioles hat and wear that too. And, 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 and pinch hit. Yeah. Did and you do what? You were gonna pinch hit for them. You're gonna just. You're gonna I was, flip-flop. yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're they're pretty terrible. So. <laughs> yeah, they, I, that wasn't part of the conversation. You said you're gonna get a Baltimore Orioles hat and wear it. You didn't say anything about their record. 
<laughs> I mean, I can still represent where I'm from, but I'm saying my point yeah. is it's like, why do we have allegiance to certain things based on where we're from? It's well, and, of, and how does that doesn't... relate to horror film? Like, like uh, if just that's, if the just first in the context of talking about was... culture and things like that, like uh, how okay. we develop taste, you know? Yeah. Well, the way, here's how, another way I look at it. So, if something's really well done, action movie, you know, drama, it's it tends to be just sort of a better experience than the quickly churned out piece of work. Now, oh, sure. it may be fun to watch the quicker quicker piece of work, but I think that you're going to get a, more of a takeaway and a better entertainment experience from that piece that took more effort and time to refine and make good. You know. Sure. Yeah. So and I don't think effort and time necessarily relate to money. Um not that I'm saying you're saying that, but I think it's it's I think it's it's not it doesn't necessarily mean experience either. I think it's if it's a clear, coherent vision. There's been so many filmmakers that have made films for the first time that have blown people away because they know exactly what they want to do. Sure. You know, I think that's a big part of it. And then yeah. you work within the resources that are available to you. If you have the budget to do certain things, right. you're going to focus on what you can make work. You're not going to just keep hammering home stuff that you just cannot afford to do, or you can yeah. spend all your money on and then it, you have nothing left. You know? Yeah. James Cameron made that. Um, was it Xeno? Xeno something? He made a he made a an, an like a sci fi movie on his own, mm -hmm. way way back, might have been in his Corman days or before, but um, you know Zeno something Zeno it wasn't Zeno Morph, but it was. Um, I don't remember. I'll find it, and uh, you know, I obviously hold Cameron in high regard, but that movie wasn't good. Mm -hmm. You know. Didn't, it didn't help that he made it like in his garage kind of thing with his out of money out of pocket. Right. Uh, well, that's where I think the, in the contrast to that is Christopher Nolan's first film, you know, that ultimately got him attention to get him the funding in the United States to get Memento made. Right. was a film that he shot running around London and yeah. made it on short ends of 16 millimeter film. Yeah. And shot it around a schedule that he knew he could make work. Like he, he looked at it in the context of like, okay, I have an apartment I can shoot in. I have this person, this person that are good enough actors and like use the resources that were available and then develop a story around that versus going, I want to tell this story, but then could not fit the puzzle, you know, because right. the it was, you know, it just was not feasible. And I think that's what we're seeing more and more filmmakers today do. It's like, well, I have a camera, I can shoot anything. Oh, I can go shoot in my backyard. I can shoot my parents' house, my my own apartment. I can shoot here. I know somebody that owns this place, and then you write the story around that. You know, right? That's that's a that's actually something I think is really valuable is to yeah find as much as much resource as you can, or as many resources as you can, and then develop a script based on your resources, knowing right. that they're available, and sort of like pre pre designing the film before the script is even really, you know, done. Right. Cause uh, at the end of the day, especially if you're, whether you're making a short film or like a spec commercial or something like that, like there has to be a goal in mind that it's serving you in some way. And sure. it's not always like, Oh, well, it's your first project. It's like, no, like when well, you're making a call, I, I want to learn, not, like I want to learn to do this or I need to shoot this and capture it so that I understand this. And then you work from there. Yeah. I think that's where, you know, those those things are become successful. And you can make something amazing without having the latest cameras and lenses and toys yeah. and all that stuff. Like, well, I love day, the story the following, and talent, location. The follow that no one following it, it's yeah, the following the concept alone is just really intriguing. It's it's if you just say it's a film, you know, like just the idea of the character's intention is just to pick someone out of the crowd and just follow them until they start to learn about their life. Right. That, at least for me, my imagination goes, oh, I can see a lot com coming from that character-wise. Not mm -hmm. only are you going to learn about who the person is being followed, 
but through the f- act of following somebody, you're then going to learn about the person who's doing the following. And so you're going to get all these different things coming from that. And there's what seems like could a plot could just sort of develop right from that in a f- right. f- somewhat easy way. That Cameron movie I was mentioning is called Xenogenesis. It's actually, mm, he okay. made it in 1978. And okay. uh, it's a little short, 12 minutes short. But um, you can see a lot of his Terminator and Alien taste in mm. that. And a lot of his in-camera effects genius of, right, you know, plates and... and um, uh, well, I think it was distances. always brilliant, too, that, like, like, the whole reason for doing The Abyss was to figure out how he was going to do Terminator 2. Oh, is that the thinking? Yeah, because he the whole aspect of they they needed to shoot certain elements in Terminator Two, I guess, underwater, and then the whole like that that it's the one scene that like is the worst scene in the movie, which is the the aliens and the morphing and all that stuff. And that's the, but that's the whole reason for the movie is to because that was the to the dial in pre, the tech behind that scene. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the the building of the magic. For I haven't Terminator heard that 2. before. I haven't heard that he did that in order to do yeah. Terminator because he got a f- fat budget for Terminator. I would assume that yeah he ha- he had had the resources to figure it out on Terminator and not have to have right. it already nailed. But um, I that's also, pretty I, common. His, his desire common to, for a lot of people to do. his desire to. Um, have someone else pay for his voyage down into the sea. It was very real. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Abyss afforded some of that. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of The Abyss was shot on a soundstage uh, with miniatures and smoke to appear to be underwater, which it actually wasn't right. even underwater. Just mm-hmm. looks dimly lit and blue, so you assume it's deep water, but it's just smoke and light. <laughs> right. Yeah. Camera effects. It's really genius. The old dry for wet technique, is what it's called. <laughs> Yeah, it works. I mean, it the, does. The submarine stuff where the well, the rover's going down and seeing it on the rock face mm-hmm. and stuff. Yeah, um, it's all set deck. <laughs> that's a, that's construction and art direction. For well, sure. yeah, construction. You know, at that point, yeah, and miniature yeah, work. Like someone, mm-hmm. I'm really trying to get on this co- podcast, and I keep hammering him on the on the on Instagram. <laughs> is Alec Gillis? Oh, really? He's a creature effects designer. I'm sure. Yeah. You know his name. He's super famous. Every time I comment, like I switch his uh, p- his posts to uh, notifications. So when he posts, and mm-hmm. I see it, and I go bam, 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 and I get on it, and I I'll put on like, "Will you be on my podcast?" And like he he just keeps coming back with like these these little quip quick like little like you know s- like comments like. All you gotta do is ask, and it's like I'm fucking asking right now. <laughs> well, you, have you sent him a message? And Dude, I, you, you the, look at the DMs; it? it's a mile of DMs from oh. me to him with zero responses. So either he doesn't has he has he get, seen any of it or I, no? I don't know. I'm is just it, gonna keep. It, he'll do it. I'm gonna get him. This is yeah. a matter of time. He can't say no forever. It's classic right. in my life where when there's some person or something I'm after, they right. keep trying to avoid me. But at some point in time, that comes around, they go. I'll fuck, okay, I'll do it, get the fuck off me, and they do it, and I go, let's do this. So how, is that how your kid came about? I think I was pretty sure how your <laughs> wife decided you're going to have a child. She, you know? It was the opposite. She was hammering me. She's like, give me the fucking baby, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> so I got I got the other end of the stick on that one. Not that That's I didn't fair. want it, but, um, no, I know. you know, I was going to, I wanted to uh, go back to, uh, you, you were talking about Quibi, and mm-hmm. I guess you could sort of generalize Quibi as um, sort of a uh, streaming a te- service. Well, yeah, but almost like just sort of a tech idea in the sense of because I worked on a couple of them and to see the production and how it was the only like difference really that I noticed on the actual creation of the show, the filming, the photography was that on the monitors they were putting the. Um, the nine to 16 aspect ratio in the center of the frame so that yeah. they knew generally it, when they do that vertical rotation portrait, what you would see. Right. And they would still knew they're going to be able to pan and scan and stuff. Right. But it kind of just feels like aside from the fact that they were making a bunch of content, they were more banking on people wanting the ability to watch long form content on your phone, but also be able to do this. Right. So they put it in their car or they hold it like whatever. And it would, you, and I, I think that was a, I think what that really was about was trying to appease 
the fact that it's just, again, it goes back to Netflix and Netflix creating a model that all streamers have to now follow in some ways, you know, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram created that model. You know, yeah. people were going to hold their phones like this to watch content. Yeah. And so Facebook, instead of doing a full nine by 16 for their content, did a one by one square, you know, and, and then would allow people to do nine by 16 by nine inside of that one by square. And then you put text and all that kind of stuff. And so I think what Quibi was really trying to do was just make it so that you would go, okay, I can still watch this and I can hold it and I'm wherever versus I have to now hold it like this and it's long in my hand. Um, you don't have but I think to, the mistake though. that they really made was just devaluing. They, they didn't understand the relationship of how, how serious people are in the context of, you know, how they consume content. And, you know, if you can get, like I can scroll through Facebook when I go to the video side of Facebook and I can watch some stand up. I can watch clips of things like, uh, like I follow Howard Stern's page and I can watch short clips from his interviews and that. It's like, you're not going to get my attention for 10 minutes to watch a full episode and hold it in my hand. Like I'm eventually going to just kind of be like, oh, I'm tired and I'm going to put well, it not down, only a full know? episode, but an episode ingrained in character arcs and yeah. story elements and little details you need to catch about writing on a wall and stuff. Right. That's too much like sort of focus required and you're going to lose it. So you may have an interesting film. Your story may be there and maybe the script may be kind of cool, but it, it's not getting received by the, by the, by the audience when they're catching it in glimpses and they're missing detail and they put it down, they pick it up and the phone goes off and they talk to somebody and they watch it again. The end of the movie, they're like, I didn't really get it and no fault right. to the movie, but it's just, you can't, pop in and out and turn the phone and, and soak and it think, all in. And I think where both Quibi and, and movie pass can be a part of this conversation where they made their mistake was not understanding how to aggregate. Well, not aggregate, how to capitalize on the data that they collected and the fact that you have all this content you're putting out movie. To me, it was, I, I was so big on movie pass when AMC came around and said, I'm like movie pass is going to get bought out. Someone's going to buy their data. You know, uh, it's like Hewlett or Hallison Matheson or whatever their company was. And the shares were like 60 cents a share. They plummeted. I'm like, I was like, this is going to skyrocket. And then they just floundered to nothing. And I'm like, you had 10, almost five years of data collection and you didn't know how but to sell it. What data did they have? They just had what movie you saw. They didn't have like your watch time and all that. What movie you saw, what time of day you saw it at, what the geographical location of other yeah, uh, places were around you, whether you're male or female and what your age was. That's, that's good. Huge. That's huge, but that's nowhere near the amount of data that Netflix is getting with the streaming when they know when you're watching. And if you continue, I mean, that's a so much. Yeah, but you know, yeah, I know exactly what time you're watching this movie. I know how many times you've seen it, especially when they created the unlimited and how many, why, why did you go see Tom Cruise's movie 10 times? It seems so analog compared to like a direct account that you log into and you're watching it on your device. Oh yeah, it is, but it's still data. It's true. It's not, that isn't data. I think think that's where Quibi failed too, was they were focused on it from a content standpoint and and thinking they were going to overtake it. And it's like, well, Look at Snapchat, look at Facebook, look at Twitter, look at Instagram. They're data collection companies yeah. and they sell back to you. Yeah. That's what it's all about. How come every time I scroll through, when I go look at my Instagram stories and I, if I just scroll the story circles, I don't see any of the advertisements that are going to pop up when I'm inside of, of the stories that will come up after looking at three people yeah. because that's a part of the platform that when you go one layer deep, all of a sudden now the ad is placed there right. so that you can't skip it. You don't know it's coming. Yeah. You know, that's where up. Quibi made their mistake. Yeah. Well, also, I don't know if you ever, like I, in one aspect, once I had, um, worked on a Quibi job, mm-hmm. um, I signed up for like the, whatever free trial. Cause I just wanted to see how that was sort of coming down the pipe to the, to the final, uh, destination. Mm-hmm. And when you, it was beautifully arranged and everything, but yeah, the I, content I they it, yeah. were, yeah, the content they were creating and the things they were doing were, were like, I'd say like a very small portion, twenty percent felt like 
serious content, and then 80% of it was this MTV kind of vibe, and they were re- revamping an MTV show and yeah. aiming at this really young audience, and it was all just sort of like goofy kind of feeling. And uh, I don't know. I'm not Maybe I'm not the demographic, but it didn't seem like anything that had any long-term value to me. Like it was all just going to be, you know, MTV type of VH1 feeling like shows. I think the problem with that is if you look at it in the context of you're going to make longer form content to distribute to a younger audience in that way, the younger audience isn't interested in what you watched growing up or what I watched growing up for in the context of free material. They're going to YouTube and they're watching vlogs. And that shit's free, and I can do it on my phone, and YouTube costs me nothing. Yeah. Why am I going to sign up for Quibi? Exactly. Yeah. I think it, it was just, I think it was a misunderstanding of the market share. I think it, there's some viability to it, but it, I, it's, to, and I, it's unfortunate that it's gone. I think it, it would have been interesting to see it continue to grow and see how it could have evolved. But at I, the same I, time, it's unfortunate. I'm not upset that more of this phone related stuff goes away because. I, as a filmmaker, I hate it because it's so small and it's so attention span driven. I want the the content that I'm creating. I want you to sit and watch it and eat it, yeah. Be- understand it, and have a emotional response to it. I just do not believe that staring into our phones allows us to create real emotional responses because it's so it's easy for us enough. to just swipe our thumb yeah. into a different app. Well, you've so also the connection got, just doesn't exist. You've also got so many different avenues of communication coming at you with that device that if you're watching something that you're trying to put your attention into and there's a Facebook message and a text and some other God knows yep. how many other apps that are popping in and filling this, it's like you're just going to get your attention pulled away no matter what. Right. And any so it's like I, it's a friend of mine posted on Twitter earlier today about the fact that, you know, he's he you know, he's just – Emotionally, he's a little all over the place when it comes to COVID and how people are staying safe and, and masks and you know how we you know cleaning and stuff like that. And he made a comment of like, you know, most people still aren't aren't doing what's necessary to, when they wipe down a surface. You got to let it dry, you know, stay wet for five to ten minutes for it actually to kill viruses. And I jokingly said, "Well, that's why I use the sprays because as I'm spraying, I get distracted out the window by a bird, and then ten minutes easily goes by, and then by the time I realize what I've done, the surface is now clean." <laughs> And I think there's there's some truth to that in the context of our phones and how we how we uh, accept content and how we engage with it and why back to the theater and, and streaming thing this is why I believe the streaming will still exist because it forces you just like a theater does to sit and watch like mm-hmm. yeah I've I've talked to more people than I can count that said like oh yeah the Irishman was cool but I took like three days to watch it on Netflix oh, yeah. me too I went and saw it in the theater. You know, with oh, the right. partnerships that Netflix has with a couple theaters around the country. Because I knew, I'm like, it's a three and a half hour movie. I want to have the experience of being locked into the story. Sure. And I think that's that's going to be a problem for certain filmmakers that sign deals with Netflix. You know, they're just, you know, granted Netflix, they gave Martin Scorsese the the control he wanted. But that's not a film designed for streaming. It isn't. It's so big, yeah. Yeah, it's so big, and 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 you're gonna. Oh, I'll watch an hour tonight. I'll watch an hour tomorrow. Or yeah. something. It's like a perfect know. film for streaming is the latest Borat movie, yeah. because Borat is nothing more than it's light enough. Than ch- it's chunks of vignettes. Yeah. It's there's a cohesive story there. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it, there not, isn't a story you, that's written. You don't. Need but you to can invest. jump in and out. You don't and need to invest. You're not like going to get lost. In, in like the Irishman needs investment. There's a lot of right. dialogue and character arcs and character traits mm-hmm. and small and growth, details character growth that if you break out and come back that if you lose that m- sort of mental story momentum that you have to regain it hurts right. your experience of the film i think right and i i right. like i miss i love and miss the the um sensory overload of going to a theater the mm-hmm. giant screen the giant sound I yeah. I feel that seeing a bad movie is better there sometimes than a good movie at home because it's the yeah. experience. I I get what you're saying, you yeah. Know? And yeah. I don't need to go to a stadium gigantic, but it's just nice having an enormous screen that's mm-hmm. 20 feet by 40 feet or something like that, you know, or 10 feet by 20 feet. 
but big enough. And this right. probably goes tailored, uh, 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 connects to what some filmmakers ultimately are trying to do is transport you to this other world and let you believe right. or live in that. And if your eyeballs are just filled with it, it's easier to suck in and stick to and not be distracted whatsoever. Right. Then well, it gives TV. you the ability for clarity too. You think about, you know, clarity on the screen because it is so large and clarity in the sound because the sound is, is so, you know, engulfing. Like, yeah, it's hard to watch a Nolan movie in IMAX because you I, last, I didn't That's see tenant yeah. in IMAX. I saw it at a drive-in. It's a different experience, but um, I saw Dunkirk in IMAX and you, there are times at Dunkirk. I'm like, Oh God, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. but I understand like he's the idea behind that film for Christopher Nolan was to create an experience. And I think that experience in the context of make you feel like you're on that battlefield. Yeah. And that's, I think the experience of filmmaking in general, but you know, he was trying to take it to a different type of place, you yeah. know? And I think that's what you, I can't do that in my home theater. Like a buddy of mine has like a, the Q OLED, uh, you know, uh, 4K television, Samsung at his home, and then he's got a 7.1 surround. And he invited. This was last year. He was like, "Oh, you got to come over and check out Blade Runner 2049. I know how much you love like the way that was shot and it was beautiful and stuff." And I was like, "Cool." And I'm sitting. It's like a 46 inch television. I'm sitting. He's like, "Sit right here." And he's all excited. Yes. And I'm sitting there, and he's like, "You're still." And it comes on. Mostly room. Yeah, yeah. And I'm so I'm kind of like, "How much you pay for this?" Yeah. And I was like, "Yeah, I wouldn't pay that." Yeah. He's like, "You don't think it's cool?" And I was like. It's fine. The only like, way but I'm, is to yeah, have that, you know, it's got to be big enough. It's got to be a projector because yeah. it's got to be big right. enough to engulf right. your whole sort of sensory visual sense. And it's got to be dark, you know. Right. That's the yeah, way you, to have the theater experience. You can't get a theater experience out of a, even a 70-inch TV. Yeah, because it's it's the inter- especially too with the light, it's like the interference of yeah, everything. Exactly. Of the distortion of the image and all that yeah. stuff, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I like I hate I like the way our living room. I'm looking at my living room right now, and it's like I have the television over against the one wall, and then the opposite wall is where our our window is. And at night, they you know they put in new bulbs in the fixtures outside of our apartment doorways. Uh-huh. Like right away, like the first week, like all of a sudden the, the room is now lit up and exploding, and I'm like, <sighs> yeah, so I like was went out thinking about that like one like, night, it took it apart, like took out one of the bulbs, oh, you did? <laughs> like. You know, because they had two balls in there, it was super bright, and I was like, "This is terrible." I'm like, it's ruining my theater experience at home." You know, like, dude, that's a, a classic like gaffer move right there, dude. Get yeah. Rid of the, get, oh yeah. Bring that I mean, if I had some streaks and tips, I would have went <laughs> and just dulled it out. Don't use that. I still they'll wash, might. They'll wash off. You just use spray paint, dude. The that's, streaks will yeah, wash away in the rain. Yeah. Or, you have to use either movie paint, which is that shit doesn't come off because it's essentially paint, but it's like a gunky stuff. Or yeah. just straight up, you spray paint. That way, you right. won't ever change unless they come right, and replace yeah. it. I mean, streaks and tips will stay on if as long as water doesn't hit it or somebody doesn't touch it. You know, it's not well. Gonna, the water yeah. dripping down on the lens of the street lamp or, or the light, maybe if it's yeah, no water where, on it, you're where good. these are at, they never get wet. I mean, I could do streaks and tips; it'd be fine. But all all a uh, a, a, a maintenance guy would have to do is just use a terry cloth and boom. You know how many on. times I've seen a maintenance guy in our building? Zero, oh, <laughs> not <right>. enough. <laughs> uh, which is good. That was, if you want to that was right when last year we had a they they bought someone bought our building and right away they made all these upgrades. Sure, they put in new lamps, put a, a new exit sign in, and some other crap. And they were like, "Oh, we're raising the rent." And I was like, "I bet you oh, all for upgrades." Shit, I bet you all the shit he did was like was like uh, fire code. It wasn't even that he wanted it. Oh yeah, it's that's all that he had. Yeah, to that's do all it. it was. Yeah, it's all the stuff he had. To yeah. Do. yeah, for sure. Because the especially because the light fixtures that we used to have were these old like '90s like I liked them because it kept everything really dark and dim out there, but it was yeah. enough light that it was you could safely walk around. But we have little lights outside of our doors that you would have to turn on to see like to put your key in, otherwise yeah. it'd be pit, almost pitch black. Yeah. I don't have to use that light anymore now. It's it's like I'm almost like turn turn some of that off. Do like you, are you it's too bright? Are, do you have your own light on you right now, or is it all this ambient? I do. I have a, oh, a okay. little uh, LED say, panel. Light coming in through your window and it's that bright, you're fucked. Oh well, that's I have a little light behind this computer monitor oh, back okay. here that's just lighting up that wall. It's hard to tell to try to to try to help the webcam from like 
freaking out. Yeah, getting all mudded out or whatever it does to. Yeah, the, yeah, because it like it would see me, but then because like, it can't see the background, it's like trying to constantly yeah. expose. Everything the background must be in full exposure. Like, I'm gonna tweak out. Yeah, I'm gonna freak out. I don't know what to do. Yeah, yeah. the GoPro idea that you're doing, I forgot that you did that. And I'm, as the whole this whole time we've been talking, I'm like, man, I wish I have like my GoPro is just right here, and I was like. I, yeah. I know that would be easy to work. I was like, damn, I should have done that. Well, I you told me about it. the cam link and, and I yeah. got one. I realized that it's plug and play. And I'm like, that's, it's, it's like, I don't yeah. have to, I don't right. have to do anything. Literally just plug it in. And, mm-hmm. and zoom recognized it without any changes. Yeah. No, it's no problems. Um, so the other, what was the other thing? I wrote a note here. Yeah. Those boutique theaters. I can really see, I can really see a world where definitely Amazon, Disney, Netflix. Yeah. I, I have a feeling that like Paramount, U, Warner, Uni, they're not necessarily going to like open their own theaters. I don't think they're too old school, but somebody like Netflix or, or I think or it Disney depends maybe. on who of, I think that will really depend on, what the relationships look like with the other companies that end up being the ones that own the theaters, you know, for Disney to own theaters is it, it makes perfect sense yeah. because they could put theaters right next to their theme park. They uh-huh. could put them in their theme parks and make it a part of, it's another attraction. They already have theaters at Walt Disney world, Disneyland. I don't believe there might be theaters nearby that are independent, but yeah. there's not, I mean, it's just Disney another theaters. branding thing for them. There's you know. non-Disney theaters right there, and I believe Disney yeah. Walk or whatever it is outside in front of them. Right. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Disneyland is still relatively small yeah. in comparison to the other Disney parks around the world. Did you ever get to yeah. check out the Star Wars? I did. I did oh, get cool. to go. I didn't get to see the latest ride, the Rise of the Resistance, which is the it's it's quote unquote a you know the dark ride. The Millennium you know, the sense Falcon of, like, one you, you walk through, through stuff. Yeah. I mean, it looked pretty cool. Our friend Damon, I know he got to see it. I got um, to go. I just made it, yeah. not knowing obviously what was up, coming up, but on right. to uh, that ride. Cause, so we took my daughter there for her birthday, which was in January. Oh, nice. And she was like starting to melt down, you know, in, uh, <laughs> by like yeah. three or four o'clock. And that was pushing it. Yeah. And I'm like, I told my wife, I'm like, I'm not leaving until I see that fucking thing. If I paid all this money, <laughs> I'm going back there. <laughs> she said, why don't we go home and then you come back? You know, because you got a day pass. Right. Like, yeah, oh, that's a good back, idea. Yeah. Then I can just get go straight in there and check. I just wanted to go in there and just see the the, <coughs> art, the artistic value of it. Yeah. Like the ride, I was like, if I miss the ride, no big deal. I just want to walk through mm-hmm. and experience all the work that was put into making that place look like you're standing on a set of a Star Wars movie. And it really did. Right. It felt right, like yeah. almost to par. That was um, for Rise of the Resistance? Well, just the whole zone of... Oh, the whole Galaxy's yeah. Edge area. You get into yeah. there. I mean, every... Like, there's a ton of detail. Oh, it's incredible. The, it's absolutely the, incredible. The the walls and the fixtures, uh, all the, like, the stucco and the layers mm. and the, the cut hanging, the cloth hanging is this very, like, you know, the, I forget the name of the planets, you know, the in the, right. in the story. But... Um, but you know, they were supposed to, this summer, they were supposed to open up the Marvel Universe on California Adventure. They were going to take the the old Soren ride in that oh. section, and it was going to be a whole Marvel thing with Spider-Man and Iron Man and Captain America and all that oh. stuff. That's pushed to, they're still working on it. But um, That's a bummer, because I didn't, I was, Soren was as old as it was. It's really yeah. good. Yeah. I know, I, I do regret, I've, I've been to California Adventure a couple of times. I do regret not going on Soren when I've gone. It's I think just, it's just, it's just like a on really the feel like, oh, good. It's old. I don't go. You know, it's a really feel. I mean, to be honest, I think that, th- that it would have been great if they had just taken the same concept and just redone it with like digital footage on a drone or something. So the whole thing is like flying over California and your orange right. groves and downtown, and then finally at Disneyland with the fireworks and everything, and. um it gives you this sort of like feel good taste of California. Right. And then they hit you with this uh, citrus smell and everything. And mm-hmm. the way the thing is gimbling, you feel like you're just in the plane and floating. It really harkens back to one of the original Epcot rides 
that I don't believe exists in uh, Disney World in Florida. And that was one of the original rides where you um, you would go through the sphere, the globe itself, and there was a whole like uh, experience that you know you would see different things and feel different things and smell different things. And that's kind of where that started from because the original ride in Soren was a limousine ride that got nixed really fast oh, really? because it did it did terrible. Well, because it ended with there was something that coincided. That. There's a great documentary on Disney Plus that's like a ten part about the Disney parks all around the world. It's really well done. Wow. Um, just watch it if, if you get a chance. Um, and they go through, there was a, a limousine ride. It was supposed to be about going through Hollywood and all this kind of stuff. Huh. And there's like a car accident that happens at the end. And it's like paparazzi and this and that. And it, co- really? it ended up right before it was supposed to debut, some big celebrity had some tragic oh. limousine oh. accident. That's good. And I so mean, they nixed the ride. Yeah. That sounds like so a weird concept the, for a Disney ride like that. It was really strange. I mean, that was – oh, the, the CEO that – this is – it was Michael Eisner who was the CEO at the time. It was the one that the Lion King and all that kind of stuff I couldn't think of earlier. Michael Eisner, yeah. Because um, California Adventure was a really it – was, it was a deviation from traditional Disney design in the context of how the park was made. It was made. You know, where – when Walt made the original park in 1953, the idea was they, they built this large like bluff around Disney so that you could never see that you were in Anaheim or see like yeah, that totally. it ended kind of thing. Yeah. And like when you walk into California Adventure, you really easily get a sense that there is another world on the outside of California Adventure. And the part of the problem with that experience is it makes it feel like a Six Flags or another just I'll be honest with you, it's it's only place. that um, Ferris wheel side. Yeah. When you're in the other portions, to I guess I'll call it the left and right. So if you enter the park and you keep going right. through, you go to that Ferris wheel side, which you can see Irvine out there. Well, but, it used to be worse because it wasn't until they redesigned what is now Cars Land, where that Cars Land when they put that the when they put that ride in, that's where they fixed it. On yeah. that side of the Because that's got a super high back face, a rock face and everything. And that's done on purpose. Yeah. It's done on purpose yeah. to try because that was a part of the idea once they once Bob Iger took over and started talking about changing the parks and stuff like that was to slowly from the sides, because they needed to renovate those sides of the park, to work its way around to the back. But the back is like the most expensive yeah, yeah. because of that roller coaster. Yeah. So that you, might who knows to, when that's gonna change. If you try to now. encapsulate that Ferris wheel end but the water where they do the uh, light and fire the light show and everything, yeah. That there's so much you'd have to do. You'd have to go twenty, thirty, forty feet up and you'd have to go mm-hmm. like, I don't know, a thousand feet across. Right. Right. God knows. And what would you make it that would be believable right. and interesting against a Ferris right. wheel? A, a city right. skyline or something? I don't know. Right. Um, yeah. Because that's where that's what makes like when you look at Galaxy's Edge, and its positioning in that park is done so well. Like when you walk into the main section, you know, and you see the Millennium Falcon and that kind of stuff. Like the back end of that ride is yeah. essentially the new bluff for that area. So right, you don't right. see beyond it because it's so high and built up, and the stuff it's the landing pad and all that kind of stuff. And it's yeah. based on the design of the park. And it's, it works you know, really well. It works incredibly well. And even the the way into that zone, that land, mm-hmm. it's a, a walkway, and you go under a, like a rock arch, and you're suddenly yep. in this like foresty vibe on this mm-hmm. I don't know what north side or south side or whatever it is. But if you enter from the other side, it has the same effect in a different way, yeah. where you feel like you're mm-hmm. literally the environment changes as you go through this short span of twenty feet or something from one mm-hmm. feeling to another. And not to mention the different characters that are walking around that all of a sudden you get this immersion, you know, Mm -hmm. that Disney is really good as is, you know, and ever since I was a kid, it's like, I think once you go through the front gates of Disneyland in uh, around the train station thing, I mean, Mm -hmm. you really do feel like you're in this like playground of fun and just. Yeah, you know, well, you're in another world. You're you're transported. Yeah, the, you're, well, you're like the plaques you're realistically there. going down Main Street USA. You're transported to Walt's hometown where he grew up, uh, and you know that's uh, that's the design. Is it supposed to be small town USA? And um, but the design of it, you know, just even the way, you know, they put in these different you know sections to get you to and from places. Like it's amazing that something built almost almost seventy years ago still holds holds up. Yeah. incredibly well you know it's yeah. 
it's definitely, I think where some people are like, oh, Disneyland's not that great. It's like, well, it's not that great in the context of sometimes when you go, it's packed full of people. So yeah, it doesn't that's, feel that's like tough. it's that, you know, spacious and amazing. But that's going to change now, you, have you to, know, for sure. You're timing us. Well, there's nobody there now. I mean, God damn. Well, right. Yeah. Can you imagine? <laughs> anyway, um, that's like a whole other conversation. You know, what I was going to say is the, uh, uh, to to dip down in altitude for a second and touch back on uh, the horror genre. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, S- Disney doesn't necessarily make horror films, but when they have a scary character in a, an animated film or something like that, they do a really good job of invoking of that having that character invoke fear into the protagonist or to the viewer or whoever. Mm-hmm. Um, it may not be just unbelievably, it's not like a bloody nightmare or horror thing, but you know, a basic example, um, even like, uh, this sounds silly, but Ursula from the little mermaid, mm-hmm. her contrast in that film and, her puppeteering the mermaid uh, um, I'm forgetting the mermaid's name there and conning her into doing things which the kids may not have picked up on but I'm sure the parents did right you know that's another albeit lighthearted but a really good example of sort of a, a, a horror genre character being used in a film man, uh, manipulating somebody mm-hmm. you know and I'm forgetting the I details, but she wanted the mermaid character to do something that would eventually help her. Right. And well, it was a part of her. She was trying to become human. You know, it's, I think that was some of that too, especially in that time period for Disney, there was similar themes between like little mermaid, Lion King and Aladdin, especially in those areas. Like you think of Jafar from Aladdin, he wanted to become the Sultan. Uh, Scar in Lion King wanted to become the King. You know, Ursula wanted to become, I believe she wanted to become human to take over. I can't fully remember. But, like, that's and that's kind of was the model in but some they, of those ways they, the stories were told. The writing and the animation and things. Um, what was the Lion King character's name? The, the, just just having a, he had the scar. Was it Scar? scar. His name was scar, scar, yeah. Yeah. So, as simple as that was, and Pixar did this well, and I know there's relationships mm-hmm. between Pixar people. And, and Disney, right. but the subtlety, the subtlety in which they sold the scariness of a character and Disney by design had to s- tread lightly there because they don't want to f- completely freak kids out. But right. to just have the bad guy have s- simply have a scar aside from the name that mm-hmm. alone tells a kid a lot, right? You say, okay, this guy's bad. And he talks right. like, hello, you know, he's got the deep, uh, mm-hmm. I want you to come in my lair, you know? So it's very simple, but effective, you know? And Pixar mm-hmm. did a lot of, I don't, I can't remember a scary character, but their films and the way they did them, very simple yet effective, very subtle things, you know? What's well, like in, for Toy Story. Remember the bully you know, in the, Toy Story? The bully was the kid, yeah. the neighbor kid. You know, in Monsters Inc., it was the the squirmy uh, the monster character that would do anything to scare a kid. And um, I'm trying to think of the other big ones uh, from Pixar. But and so take those characters that Disney made and just extrapolate the simplicity of them expressing that that's the antagonist and that they have bad intention. Mm-hmm. Something like. The Exorcist, or even like Halloween, mm-hmm. were very simple in their in their characters being evil and bad. I mean, the chick laying in bed right. and she just having her head, you know, using special effects and having her head turn around. Who doesn't know about that scene? Even if right. you don't know the plot of the movie, you know about that scene. The chick's mm-hmm. head turns around. You know, it's like holy shit. Right. So you watch that and you're like, okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And Halloween, Michael Myers sunk in, man. He's just a guy with a with a like a, a mechanic suit on and a butcher knife, you know, a, a steak knife and a yep. a, a a mask. 
Well, yeah, what's interesting so about simple. Halloween too is how much it takes from the original ta- Texas Chainsaw Massacre film. Because if you really go back and watch that film, you know, May 1973, it's 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 funny how Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's funny how that movie still stands up so well today, and it's yeah. because of the storytelling, yeah. and it's not focused on. Right. The the main villain, exactly. you know, he, he, you that's focus not on the thing that everyone's you're you're that's right. the, that's the icing on the cake, the, the red, right, the, yeah. right, and and so much of that was there were little elements of that that were taken throughout horror films for decades and generations on is that you know we you know we think about the context of like Freddy Krueger and and Nightmare on Elm Street, it was like you remember like, yeah, he was scary looking stuff like that, but it was the, the details were more in the fact that he would, you know, come into your dreams and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Like, you Which know, is, that, that was, was a super very much scary back to the Chainsaw aspect. Massacre. It was like the second you went into that house, you were in his world, yeah, yeah. you know, and that kind of stuff. And it's same thing with the Saw films. I've, I can't stomach them, but I've watched pieces and looked at things and stuff like that. And it's very much, you're in the, the guy's world. Yeah. And that's a, big that's become a big element of horror films you know look at it when you're in uh the clown in. what's his name um forgot can't remember his name i've seen both of them but you're you become in Penny, his pennywise? world his pennywise? It's his control is it pennywise pennywise yeah pennywise yeah that's what yeah you go down in the into the um right. tunnel in the, like in the they water. go into that house the house is kind of that that's the doorway to that you know, and then you go. They go down to the basement. and They go into the little, yeah. like the tunnel kind of thing. It's a classic um, horror. Yeah. Um, but it takes you along a journey whatever. too. Like, like you, if you look at that, it's funny how much it relates to Texas Chainsaw Massacre because it's the same thing for the the you know the kids you know in Texas Chainsaw Massacre are driving in a van and they're just looking for a place to hang out. And it's <laughs> the story is a little loose. Yeah. In that sense of like, well, why do they stop at this house? This and that. It's like there's definitely as films have progressed, you know, it's become stronger. But again, it's like the house is the portal. It's the beginning stage yeah. of all of that and what took takes place and all that kind of yeah. stuff, you know. And that's that's the foundation for it. That's the foundation for Freddy Krueger. You know, it's in it's in your mind, yeah. but it's still it, that's what houses that fear. You yeah. know, it's a house of fear. You know that what yeah. what I just thought of. Uh, I know it's not a horror genre film, but it taps into that. What you're we're only allowed about. to talk about Disney or horror films <laughs> in this podcast. No, well, no, do you remember how old you were and your first experience of seeing Stand by Me? Hmm, I was probably. I'm gonna say like somewhere between like ten to thirteen. Somewhere. And do in you that remember space. how you felt when that when they cut to the shot of the Ray Brower dead body? in the bush at the end of the train tracks. It's, it's very quick, but that I can't remember. Scene, so you're following these kids and they keep ingraining into you, the viewer, the relationship to the, between the, the group of kids, right? Who's afraid of what, who's weak, who's strong, who's, mm-hmm. you know, their dad beat him, all these very human uh, elements and, and story, uh, 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 character elements and then they finally get to this body and you feel like you're part of the group and you feel like you're a, a, t- a 12, 13 year old or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I forget how old I was, but even now looking back and, and just right. examining the film from a horror aspect, that's a pretty scary, like if you were to think what could be a, just the most, just sort of super you know, diluted down horror film down to just a moment of fear, maybe mm-hmm. something like that, where you, you maybe you don't expect it coming or it's talked about, but you're not sure if you'll actually get there or right. see it. And then when you actually get there and you see it and it's a dead body and you know, these kids are young and impressionable, you know, they're seeing it and you're mm-hmm. seeing it. And it's uh, a, a great example of how to sort of have this like, long foreplay of what is going to happen and build up. And it wasn't built up in the sense of a horror movie where, you know, someone's going to die or there's a killer after you, but it's right. built up in the sense of, you know, that something scary to this kid is there and they're heading towards this, this, uh, moment of shock and what the, you know, they don't really, 
maybe understand what it is that they're going to see and they're not ready for it, but they do. I'm trying see to, it and I'm trying to look up right now because that made me think about the first time I saw an image from one of the gremlins films uh, when I was a kid. And I think it might've been gremlins three. I didn't expect gremlins two would have, I'd have been too young. Yeah. Cause gremlins two came out in 1990 and I was, I would have been four, but I remember, I'll never forget. Um, well, Gremlins three was like a com- like a comedy almost in comparison to like the first. It? One. Maybe it was Gremlins two, and they were just playing it in the theater. I was like eight, yeah. and maybe they were just playing it around Halloween or yeah. something. But I remember being in the theater. There's a theater in my hometown that is gone now, but it was in the mall, and you could the way you could walk through the theater. As you walked past each theater door, you could see the screen because you kind of entered immediately and there was a screen. And I remember and all the doors would be open and stuff like that. And I remember walking through, like leaving the theater or maybe uh, probably going to the movie um, and seeing the gremlin like, like, eh, you know, on the, yeah, on yeah. the screen and being freaked out, like oh, really? totally freaked out. And what's interesting about that to me is how I don't remember the movie I was seeing, but I remember seeing something as I walked through the yeah. theater, <laughs> you know, of that. Because yeah. I remember hearing about Gremlins and, and that mo- that genre of movies, but I had never seen it. And I remember being like a kid and just being like, oh, that's probably really creepy and yeah. scary. And then seeing like a piece of it and being like, oh, my God. John yeah. Carpenter's version of the thing turned my fear level like the highest it had been when I saw mm-hmm. that. And I may not have seen a movie before that one I'm you know maybe a couple but it was like the first right and I think it was at a drive-in but so it was the environment uh, added to the fear in a way mm-hmm. but <clears throat> that was a very strange twisted I don't know if, <laughs> yeah. it, if it's billed as a horror movie it's probably a thriller but I mean to see a human man right get infected and then sort of in in so many ways then turned into like morphed and i mean it's like Mm -hmm. his body becomes something and it's completely absurd and uh, just wild that's like the it reminds me of thinking like the first time i saw the fly oh yeah that's good when he starts change jeff goldblum starts to change into the fly i remember i was at my i I definitely was probably like nine or ten they had a it was on television subtle transition at first it's makeup so you see it's happening it wasn't just immediate right right i mean that that element of it too the way they they didn't just have this quick transition, especially a film in the late eighties, uh, you know, using practical effects to make that happen. Yeah. Like you feel it. Yeah. Like you're like, oh practical God, effects you know? makes it better. Yeah. makes a horror film better in my opinion, because yeah, when it's, time. when it's organic on screen, mm-hmm. the fear is more real to me than a CG, than an obvious CG at least. Oh yeah. Because then you, well, that, you buy it more, you know, that's what was so interesting about, the actor who played uh, Pennywise in it, yeah. um, Bill, the um, or the new one, remember, the new guy. Yeah, I forget. Um, and it, like he had the part of the reason why he had he got the role was because he was his eyes were so yeah. large, and it created that sense of fear. That smile you know, he and did he could that, create like, the voice and all that stuff too. That crazy little like eh, looking it, smile. Yeah, he could do. yeah. I mean, like that's that's the character. It's all facial character emotion at that point you yeah know? they probably saw a lot of people and were up right you know he, he and he still wore prosthetics and all that stuff like they raised his the crown of his head and all that kind of stuff he wore all those things and but he had you know, that they, he had the bones of it and the base of it right you know? right yeah his facial stri- it's funny watching it like there's a, a movie he's in now on netflix that he did with um the guy who, who does spider-man now and uh and he did it with uh, uh robert pattinson and He's in that movie. Oh, Bill Skarsgård. That's who the oh, actor is. Bill Skarsgård. And um, and I'm watching him in this movie. He's great in it. But I'm just like, I just keep seeing Pennywise. Sure. Like, <laughs> you know, because it's see that. so so much yeah. a part of his physical features. Yeah, yeah. But I think that I think as he continues to do more films and he, as he gets more successful uh, with those different types of genres, like I think people will see him It'll as, as a different type of actor. Yeah. Especially so. if he does something else that does well and yeah, gets right. prominent. It's very much like how, how when Robert Pattinson did Twilight and everybody was like, oh, he's just, you know, he's a Twilight guy. Da, da, da. And yeah. it's like he completely changed he's past it now, how yeah. he was viewed as an actor. Like he's That's why you always see actors that. do something like if they're playing the boyfriend and it gets popular, mm-hmm. then they go yeah. take those those murderer roles. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Like, oh, wait, like no, I, can kill, I can kill. I'll kill. 
Yeah. I'll be in I think Matthew room. McConaughey was the, you know, he was the heartthrob <laughs> all the time. They did True Detective and oh. now he's this massive dramatic actor. True Detective season one, dude. Yeah. I, 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 know I don't know that I've ever had a favorite. series grab me. That thing. And I, I didn't, I didn't deny it, but I put it off and I don't think I saw it until six months after it was released. Something like Which that. I think helped too, because then all the episodes were out. Oh, maybe. Yeah. And because when I did see it, whatever, it was like finally. I don't know if I signed up for HBO or something, but yeah, it, I sat there for the straight through eight hours and watched it all. Yeah. I could not let go. I'm like I gotta mm-hmm. watch the next episode. So I remember doing. I don't do that anymore, but I I remember doing that. I th- I didn't watch all eight for that. But I did at least like four hours. I think I finished it in two days. And then I did the same thing for Amazon's uh, Man in the High Castle. Uh, and it was funny because I, I remember I watched six hours <laughs> of the 10 hour season and I was sick because oh, wow. I had gotten the flu. And I just, I laid on my couch in my tiny little apartment. Uh, and you remember my tiny little studio apartment? And I just watched not, I couldn't turn away from it. Wow. I was like, this is so good because it's this alternate reality kind of thing. And, you know, it's World War Two. What if the Nazis had won World War Two, and now the United States is split between Nazi Germany and it's uh, the American states of not of Germany, uh, and then the West Coast is owned by Japan. It was just very interesting. <laughs> it's it, a book by Philip K. Dick that was written. Oh, really? In the Philip 70s. K. Dick. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's really fun when something gets you and you're like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. The like last that. thing that had me like that was the trailer for. Um, the Joker with Joaquin Phoenix. Mm. I was like, "What did you think of the? I don't think I've ever talked to you about the, what you thought about the movie." Well, he, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for bring your story into a believable world that could exist, and all the events that take place, and all the action, all all the characters mm-hmm. are not far fetched from even if it's in t- from reality. Three, the year three thousand forty seven, right? Make it so that it seems like it could actually be real and happen mm-hmm. terminator is a good example of that they the way it was played out where well, you're like okay yeah i buy it you know it's completely mm-hmm. absurd but it's done real enough and and tactfully enough and 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 and, and there's there's a, a tangible sort of thing to it you know reese he can only come through naked and it's just this organic you know time mm-hmm. you just believe it you know and well, i think it's also an element to the terminator films where that especially in T1 and T2 is the fact that Cameron didn't make all these transgressions to be like, Oh, well when they need weapons, they can just summon them or they yeah, can, I mean, if they need devices, they, when they show up in this world, it's whatever they brought with them. That's right. all they got. Right. It's like, and it, I think that, like, that does a lot for the yeah. story. It really does. Yeah. Cause it forces characters that aren't native to the environment to find something that, they assimilate with yeah. to make it work for them. A jo- and that's very George- much, I think back to Joker, I I'm think sorry, that's what yeah. made that exactly what you said of putting it in a, in a, in a, it's something that you can relate to as an audience, especially in a character development yeah. story. And, you know, all these different little elements, these little pieces, you know, these little clues and stuff like that are, yeah. are a part of that deeper layer of storytelling. But I think it's, that's very much why I think people really enjoyed it was they, could see that as a re as a reality, you know? Yeah. So crazy. So what made that good for me was not only that is the believability and, and I, mm-hmm. I, on and I mentioned that one, like a good way to encapsulate that is something that I, I don't know if he coined this or it's originally from him, but mm-hmm. George Lucas always said it has to feel like a lived in envi- uh, universe. And yeah. he's mentioning star Wars and mm-hmm. that, you know, like rogue one to me was a really good example of a lived in version of star Wars. So anyway, yeah. that that if you're gonna go high and above and beyond and just be completely absurd, at least stay believable in the sense of things aren't just happening and it's everything's easy for right. the main character. The universe has to be grounded that it plays in. It right. has to be grounded, and that's even if why, it's in within its own universe, right? You know, it's like what's, that's what made the Matrix so successful. Right. The Matrix is literally you are literally going through a journey through the Matrix in the first film. Sure. You, the audience is Neo, but the film is so grounded in its barriers that you can relate to everything. Well, you know what's a common theme with all these films? 
like Matrix, Joker, Terminator. Mm-hmm. These main characters have to experience pain mm-hmm. and go through sacrifice in order to reach their their final goal and their 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 ultimate mm-hmm. goal. It can't right. be this skating on through and just I have a uh, you know it's a reason why I don't like I'm not a fan of a lot of these comic book characters like Superman and Spider Man. I have nothing against them. If you're if you're bulletproof and you can shoot lasers out of your eyes and you can fly in outer space, what where's the fucking story? Right. Who's right. gonna beat you? And why mm-hmm. is there this magic rock that makes you feel like you have a sore stomach? Come on, right. dude. Did you ever see did you ever see Uncut Gems? Adam Sandler. I watched movie? it, you know, and I got about halfway through, but Oh, you didn't finish it? I was going to. I just haven't yet. Ugh, I, 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 mean, I want to I, talk with you about that so bad, but I can't because... Right. Oh, I'll have to finish it. I, yeah, I, don't, I, finish I was it, having I trouble putting my finger on why I wasn't completely sold on it. And I think it was like a one small percent, and it was very small percent because I like Adam mm-hmm. Sandler, but one small percent is it's hard for me to see him be serious. So sure. there's a little bit of that. But then... I think it was the, f- it got to the point where he was talking to some guys in a gem shop about a necklace that he was going to make. And these guys are like rappers or something. And they just kept giving him shit and giving him shit. And, and I'm like, why is this? Like, I don't even know what this guy does so far. Obviously he makes jewelry in some way, shape or well, form. He's a jewelry store. He owns Yeah, but I don't know store. that. They didn't say, they didn't show me what he did or at least give me a sense. They just assume I know because he's in a no, jewelry store. No, they do. They do. Yeah, they do. I didn't he's see constantly him make making anything. deals and stuff the whole time. He's talking. But it doesn't tell me what he does. It doesn't give me a sense yeah, of Yeah, but the second background. he goes the second he goes into the back room, it's like, "Well, that's his that's fine. Howard's that's place fine. and all that that's stuff." That's fine. Let me yeah. care about him. I didn't have yeah, anything but you, to care. So he's getting fucked with, and now the tension is rising. But I don't know why I care about him, and that's you got to you reason. you got to give it more. You got to watch the whole I thing. That's the brilliance it. of the whole movie okay. is that you will fucking hate it the entire time until you until you finish it. <laughs> oh really? Yeah. All right. I think well, that's I mean, a part I'm of the that. that's a part of the style of the Safety Brothers too. Is is well, they're I not sat, making a film for you, know, you or me or anybody. It's they're making the film that they want. They want to fuck with you the entire time. What's that other one they made b- before? Uncut? Um, like uh, running, jump, running away, or whatever. Uh, crap. You know what I'm talking about? The brothers. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I, I sat was, through I that. Forget it. it. It definitely was not your average movie, but I appreciated mm-hmm. it and I sat through the whole thing. Yeah, I didn't hate it. Right. I, it wasn't my top favorite, obviously, but I didn't hate it. it yeah, was good. I think I'd cut gems was better than that. Okay. I think it's it was. Um, it's not for everyone, that's for sure. But I think in the context of what we've been talking about, like making you feel something, I think that movie definitely makes you feel something. So you say it pays off on cut. Mm-hmm. Okay. It pays off in a way that I like the way films pay off too, which is why I think a lot of people hated it because it's okay. a way it's it's not mainstream. Well, that I really appreciate that. So I, I yeah. definitely need to watch it. Right. Yeah. Um, the. Expensive electronic devices telling me that I've put them through the ringer and they need a break. <laughs> um, so, you want to plug anything? You want to talk about the $100 million feature you're shooting next week? Um, yeah. It's uh, it's called... It's not based in any sort of reality. It's called Gnomes 3. <laughs> <laughs> Smurfs 5. <laughs> Smurfs 5. It's all um, CG. I mean, it's 2020. I need a paycheck. Yeah. So, um, no, I am. I am starting a movie in November. I'm doing one day on a, on a feature that it, it's total actor availability to do it on in November, and then scheduling conflict moves the rest of production right now to January, and wow. then we we go to Oklahoma to shoot, and um, the one day it will be here in Los Angeles. And then I might have another small independent film that would, it was the DP jumped off and I might be jumping on. They'd only shot a small portion of the movie. So we're kind of like somewhat restarting it, but they're talking about doing 10 days to start December 1st to December 10th. Um, Both kind of interesting. One's kind of a cartel movie. Um, I have to go through the latest version of the script. Quite a bit's changed. I'm told Hmm. for the better. I mean, I've read, 
four versions now and every version gets better. Oh, cool. Just, just better in the sense of like, it gets more interesting and it's a little less fluff, which I mean, at the end of the day, you're not going to shoot every single thing on the page anyways. I mean, you know, you're going to, you're going to shoot what makes sense and you're not that you're going to avoid things, but you know, once you get to the editing editing room too, it's like things are going to get chopped to make the film better. And then the, the other one is about, uh, a boxer, you know, kind of, I don't want to say coming of age story, but like his redemption story kind of thing. Like, um, you know, a guy who kind of fell down on his luck and he's building himself back up, you know, has a cultural background and stuff like that. So it should be interesting. See if, you know, cool, man. see if those happen. That's what I'm, I'm trying to work on. You know? Good for you going after the, the, and uh, I like to call it kind of the, the, the work that's in your heart, you know, like not, yeah. not taking the like, job that's not going to offer you any creativity down there you know shooting right. the thing that's already been designed around whatever and you're just kind of filling right. the void that was that was the interesting thing about the film the the boxing film was i knew there was already a dp that had shot some stuff for it and then it stopped because of covid and then um i was the i was originally asked a year ago to shoot it and i couldn't because i was already booked um when they were going to start production and i i just i couldn't i couldn't do it and i said you know if you guys can move the schedule and they said, well, we can't. And then they ended up having to move the schedule because they had, they had some actor problems, yeah. con- like scheduling problems. And then we reconnected the director and I, and then he was like, well, actually he was like, my DP kind of, you know, walked away because of COVID and stuff like that. And I was like, okay. And he's like, I really still wanted to shoot it with you. And you know, I was like, he's like, I'll send you the latest version of the script. Let me know what you think. And yeah. I read through it. I was like, yeah, it's, it's good. I was like, it's still good. It's better than the one I read a year ago. Oh, <laughs> like, nice. So, you want to plug any uh, social, anything like that? Throw yeah, um, you find me on Instagram mostly at David C. Weldon, W-E-L-D-O-N-J-R. Uh, so I post a lot of stuff about my work, and um, you can see stuff I'm up to there. Cool. Always message me if you want. Sweet, buddy. Sure. Yeah, that's it. I appreciate you, and I'll see you yeah, good again chatting with you. sometime soon. And uh, these are uh, definitely some interesting topics. I really, mm-hmm. I really am interested in the in the boutique movie theater, uh, just movie theaters staying alive in general. So hopefully that happens. <laughs> in any I think way. it will. I think I think we're all um, not too far away from yeah. that stuff expanding and growing, and it's gonna. I think it's gonna create more work, just like how streaming did. You know. Yeah. So I think it'll it'll lend itself to be a positive thing. Yeah. David Weldon. Thank you. Thank you. 1978 podcast out. Oh, let me do my little. <laughs> do it again. The only reason she babysits is to have a The 1978 podcast. Halloween. Do you make a new one of those for each episode? No, I mean, I'm just playing some fun stuff. Oh. I don't know where I'm going to cut out on this. It's completely yeah, unscripted. Just let, it... <laughs> <laughs> just let it roll. You should have like turntables next to you, to just like you know, playing some beats. Yeah. Oh, wait. The night he came home. There it is. David Weldon, 1970 podcast out. Get your stickers. Message me. Whoop whoop. Later, bro. Bye.